Vladimir Nikolovich Nagra, Tales from the Future, The Linging Cedars of Russia book series, The Building There. From the book by Vladimir Nagra, The New Civilization, Part 1, translated by Susan Downing. Billionaire John Hitzman lay dying on the 42nd floor of his office building. That entire floor had been converted into an apartment suite for him. Over the past three years, it's two bedrooms, workout room, pool, living room, and two offices had become his refuge. Never once in these years had he set foot outside his apartment. Never once had he ridden the express elevator down to any of the office where the staff of his financial industry empire work. Never once had he gone up to the roof where his helicopter stood, its crew always at the ready to carry out the boss orders. Except that for three years, the boss had never once appeared. John Hitzman only ever saw his four closest assistants, whom he would receive three times a week in one of his office. At these short meetings, which never lasted more than 40 minutes, he would hear out their reports without any particular interest, and occasionally he'd give them brief instructions. The billionaire's direction were never discussed. They were simply carried out swiftly and precisely. The financial worth of the empire, of which John Hetzman was the sole owner, increased by 16.5% yearly. And over the last six months, when Hetzman had stopped holding any meeting whatsoever, the profit had not decreased. There were no interruptions whatsoever in the administrative mechanism he had created and then left to function on its own. No one knew how much Billionaire was really worth. His name was hardly ever mentioned in the press. Hitzman strictly observed the rule, never talked about money. Way back when the young Hitzman father would give him this advice, let the politicians flicker across the TV screens and the newspaper pages. Let the presidents and governors talk with the people and give them assurances that their lives will be happy. Let the visible millionaires ride around in luxury cars surrounded by bodyguards. You, Johnny, you don't need to do. You don't need to do all of that. You need to always be behind the scenes, controlling the governments and presidents. The billionaires and the destitute of various countries by means of your power, the power of money. But they should not have any idea who's controlling them. This system is exceptionally simple. I created a monetary fund that has many investors on paper, but in, but in reality, it contains 70% of my own capital under various different names. On the outside, to the, to the dim wit masses, it looks like the fund was created to support developing countries. But in reality, I created it I create it as a mechanism for collecting payments from all countries. I'll give you an example. An armed conflict begins between two countries and one of them, or more likely both of them, needs money. Let them have it because they're paid back with interest. Social upheaval occurs in some country and once again they need money. Let them have it. They're paid back with interest. Two political forces are fighting for power. One of them will receive money from our agents, and once again, they're paid back with interest. 
Russia alone pays us $3 billion every year. When he was 20, John Hitzman was particularly fond of spending time with his father. One day, this father, who had previously always been strict and unsociable, called John into his office and invited him to make himself comfortable in a chair by the fire. He himself poured John a cup of John's favorite coffee with cream and asked him and asked him with unfeigned interest. Do you, do you enjoy studying at the university, John? I don't always find it interesting, Dad. It seems to me that the professors don't always explain the laws of economics in a very clear or comprehensible way. John answered honestly. Good. An accurate observation. But it would be even more accurate to put it this way. Today's academics aren't capable of explaining the laws of economics because they have no understanding of them. They somehow think that economic is the domain of economists, but that's not the case. It's psychologists, philosophers, and gamblers who control the world economy. When I turned 20, John, my father, and your grandfather initiated me into the secrets of management. You're already 20, John, and I consider you a worthy vessel for this knowledge. Thank you, Father, John replied. And so through this, these fireside chats, John began to study laws of economics laws different from the ones taught in college. His father used a unique method to teach his son. All instruction was imparted through intimate, kind-hearted discussions that included examples and even playful elements. The information that John's father laid out before him was unbelievable, and it goes without saying that he couldn't have acquired it in any university in the world even the most prestigious, prestigious. Tell me, John, his father asks, do you know how many rich people there are in our country or in the world? They publish their names in business journals and list them in order according to their worth, John answered quietly. Do you know what place we occupy in these lists? This was the first time his father had said we instead of I. That meant he thought of him, John, as an owner too. And although he didn't want to upset his father, John replied, Your name doesn't appear on those lists, father. Yes, correct, it doesn't. In spite of the fact that our profit from year alone, from one year alone exceeds the entire worth of many, who appear on those lists. And my name isn't on any list because one should never make one's wallet transparent. Many people on these lists are working directly or indirectly for empire. Yours and mine, son. Dad, you must be an ec economic genius. I can't begin to imagine how you can get such a huge empire as Russia to make tribute payments to us every year without any military intervention at all. Heisman Sr. took the fireplace tongues, poked the logs, and then silently poured a glass of white wine for himself and his son. He took a small sip, and only then did he continue. It isn't that I developed some kind of operation. The capital I control only allows me to give orders. Others carry them out. Many analysts, presidents, and geniuses in the government of various countries would be quite surprised to learn that it's not their action that determine the current state of their countries, but my wishes. The Polytechnic Center's Economics Institute think tanks, and governmental structures of many countries don't realize that they work strictly along courses developed by my division, and that these courses are few in number. For example, 
Russia's entire social, economic, policy, and military doctrines are defined and controlled by one division with a staff of four psychologists. Each of the four has four secretaries. None of them knows about what the others are doing. I'll show you how we manage to control things. It's a simple enough process. But first, John, you need to understand the real laws of econ economics, the ones you never hear about from the academics. They simply have no idea they exist. The law is this. Within a democratic society, the presidents, governments, banks, and the large and small business owners of all countries work only for one business owner located at the top of the economic pyramid. They all work for my father. Now they work for me. And before long, they'll be working only for you. John Hitzman looked at his father and couldn't fully take in what he'd said. Certainly he knew his father was rich, but here he wasn't talking simply about wealth, but about the superpower that he, John, would inherit. He was having a hard time fully comprehending this incredible piece of information. How was it possible that within a free democratic society, everyone, starting with the president and ending with hundreds of thousands of large and small firms, all of them independent legal entities, entities were essentially working for one person, his father. When your grandfather told me what I've just told you, I couldn't immediately comprehend what he'd said. And I imagine you don't quite get everything either, John. But understand this. Heitzman Sr. continued, There are wealthy people in the world. But for every wealthy person, there's one who's wealthier. And there's one who's the wealthiest of all. All the other wealthy people, and consequently all who work under them too, work for him. The wealthiest one, such is the law of the system in which we live. All the talk about selfless aid to developing country is nothing but a smokescreen. Certainly wealthy countries offer credit to developing countries through international funds. But the only real reason they do that is to receive good, solid interest in exchange for the use of those funds to receive tribute payments. For example, Russia pays $3 billion a year to the IMF. And that figure represents only the interest Russia has accumulated on the money it's borrowed. Many economists know that the main financing for the IMF comes from US, from US capital. They understand that the sky high interest that countries pay to borrow money goes to the U.S. But who specifically receives it? No one knows that. The U.S. as a country is no more than a convenient front in the game of capital. And the U.S. is the country most dependent on capital. Tell me, John, are you aware that America has a national debt? Yes, Dad, I'm aware of that. The debt figure is astronomical. For last year, it amounted to, the interest paid on America's debt amounted to. So do you see that a country that lends on money to other countries itself takes on huge amounts of debt? But from whom does it borrow? Do you understand that? From its own Federal Reserve. But to whom does that belong? This Federal Reserve, to, to, John had never thought about who America owed money to. 
But as he answered his father's questions, he understood. In the U.S., each taxpayer pays into the Federal Reserve. But it, the Federal Reserve, is a private bank. Consequently, all of America pays hundreds of billions of dollars to some private people or to one private person. His whole life, Hitzman had never been a vain person. He'd led a, a healthy life, as they say, didn't drink or smoke, followed healthy diets, and worked out every day. It was only in the last six months that he'd stopped going to his workout room. For half a year, he's been lying in bed in one of his spacious bedrooms that was, that was chock full of ultra-modern medical equipment. In the room next door, doctors were on duty 24 hours a day working, working in shifts. But John Hitzman didn't, up, didn't trust modern medical science. He saw no need to even talk with the doctors. The only person he would occasionally favor with short answers was a certain psychology professor. Hitzman wasn't even interested in knowing the doctor's names, including this professor. Although he took note that this one was the most sincere and honest of the bunch, the professor talked a lot. But what often came across when he spoke were not only medical assertions, but also his own thoughts and his desire to find out what was causing Hitzman's illness. Hitzman illness. I was thinking about your condition last night and this morning. I can see it now. I'll figure out what's causing your illness and then, once we've eliminated the cause, you'll get well in short order. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Heitzman. I forgot to say hello. Good morning, Mr. Heitzman. I was a little distracted by my own thoughts. The billionaire didn't respond to the professor's greeting and didn't turn in his direction. But that was how he acted with all the doctors. And sometimes when a doctor came in, Heitzman would give a signal, a slight movement of the wrist. And everyone knew that this signal meant go away. He didn't give the signal to the professor. And so the professor excitedly continued sharing his train of thought. I disagree with my colleagues who say you need liver, kidney, and heart transplants. It's true that these organs aren't functioning as effectively as they should. Hmm. Yes, not at as effectively as they should be. The cause of this lies in your deep depression. Hmm. Yes, your depression. I've read your chart over several times and I think I've made a very important discovery. Your primary care doctor is amazing. He note down everything in great detail. Every time he examined you, he also made notes about your psychological state. Your internal organs began to fail as soon as you entered a depressed state. Hmm. Yes, a state. Now here's the most important question. Did the depression arise when your internal organs began to fail or was it the other way around? Did the depression cause all your body's organs to fail? I'm certain that's it. I'm completely certain that the primary cause is the depression. Hmm. Yes. Your deep depression. The state when a person stop, stops striving toward a goal, loses interest in what's going on around him, when he doesn't see any point in living. And then the brain began sending out weak or erratic signals to the entire body. The entire body, the stronger the depression, the weaker the signals. 
And when the depression reaches a certain level of intensity, the brain can stop sending these signals entirely and then death ensues. And so the primary cause is depression, but how can we eliminate it entirely? Modern medicine doesn't know how to do that. I've looked into folk medicine and now I'm convinced that the cause of your deep depression is the evil eye. Hmm. Yes, or to be more precise, someone put the evil eye on you and I have a lot of facts that can prove it. The billionaire wanted to give the go away signal with his hand. He had no use for all those esoteric alternative healing practitioners today who promised to remove hexes and the evil eye and provide protection against them. He thought of them as small businessmen or swindlers. It seemed that the professor, sensing that modern medicine was powerless here, had himself migrated to the ranks of these so-called alternative healers. Before the billionaire could give the go-away signal, the professor cut him off with words that elicited a bit of interest. Faint but interest all the same. I sense that you're about to send me away now. Maybe forever, I ask you. I beg you. Give me five or six more minutes. If you understand what I tell you, then it's possible that you can get well. And I'll have, and I'll have made a great discovery. Well, actually, I've already made it. I just need to confirm it. The billionaire did not give the go away signal after all. For three seconds, the professor stared without blinking at the hand of the man lying motionless before him. And seeing that he had permission to proceed, quickly began speaking once more. People look at each other in a variety of ways, with indifference, with love, with hatred, envy, fear, respect. But it isn't the eyes. External expression that plays the key role here. The outer expression can be nothing more than a mask, like the false smile of a waiter or a salesperson. What's important is the true relationship, the true feelings one person has for another. The more positive feelings people direct toward this or that person, the more positive energy concentrates inside him. Conversely, if he's surrounded, if he's surrounded predominantly by negative feelings, then it's the negative and the destructive that build up within him. The common folk call this the evil eye, and this is what healers focus on in their practice. Not all of them are, are charlatans, not by a long shot. The thing is that a person who's received too much negative energy from those around him is himself capable of neutralizing it, or in other words, of bringing it back into balance. When a healer tells someone that he's removing the evil eye by doing certain actions, Actions, he's helping the person believe that he's been cleansed. If the person believes the healer, then the person himself really does bring the positive and negative into balance inside him. If he doesn't believe, then this doesn't happen. You don't have faith in healers, and consequently, they can't help you. But that doesn't mean that you don't have an excess of negative psych energy in you. Energy that's harmful to your organism. Organism. Why do I say you have an excess of negative energy? Well, because everyone around a person like you can't help but view you with envy. And not in the positive sense, they also might see you or more precisely relate to you with hatred. Those would be the people you fired or haven't given raises to. Many people sensing your power could be fearful of you, so you see. This all is negative energy, and you need positive energy to counterbalance it. You can receive this from your family members and relatives, but your wives betray you, and you have no children or friends, and you don't spend time with your relatives. You have no source of positive energy. 
It is possible for a person to produce as much positive energy as he needs on his own. But to do that, he has to have a cherished goal or dream, one that will cause positive emotions to arise as he gradually moves toward it. You've achieved a great deal, and it seems that now you no longer have any dreams. But this is very important. Having a goal and moving toward achieving it, I've analyzed the physical and the psychological state states of various types of businessmen. A person who makes some dough, bakes some pies and sells them is happy to have the opportunity to then buy the items he needs. And he dreams of developing his business because only when it grows can he enjoy many of the prizes of an advanced civilization. A prominent banker or the owner of a profitable firm also strives to develop his business and increase his income, but he's often less passionate about it than the person who bakes or sells pies. It sounds paradoxical, but it's a known fact. He's less passionate, less because far fewer appealing prizes lie ahead for him than for the pie seller. For him, the majority of civilization's achievements are in prizes, but mundane reality. If someone who's not particularly wealthy has a chance to buy a car, then buying it gives him a feeling of satisfaction or even delight. But a person who's relatively wealthy won't feel happy when he gets the latest car model. For him, it's a trifle. It sounds paradoxical to say that the wealthy have fewer occasions for happiness than those who are less well off. But it's true. There is one more thing that can bring happiness. Conquering one competitors. But it seems that you, Mr. Hitsman, have no competitors. And so it turns out that you have nothing but negative energies affecting you. And a lot of them. Oh yes, and I forgot to say that there is one energy, a strong, unbelievable, strong energy that can vanquish a multitude of negative energies. And it is called the energy of love. It's the energy you feel when you are in love and someone loves you. But unfortunately, you don't have any woman at all in your life. You don't seem to be interested in them. And given your age and your current condition, you probably won't ever be interested in them again. I have a lot of corroborating facts to back up my conclusion. I've compared the statistical data about the lifespans of wealthy people. Prominent politicians and presidents over the past hundred years. The results are pretty convincing. The lifespan of the powerful people of this world is not so very great compared to that of regular folks. And often it's even less. Paradoxical, but facts are facts. Presidents and millionaires who are under the constant care of doctors and have access to the most up-to-date medical technologies and medicines, who have the ability to consume only the highest quality food, get sick and die with the same frequency, frequency as everyone else. These facts eloquently attest to the fact that the negative energy surrounding a person is extremely powerful, powerful, and that even the most modern medical methods are no match for it. So does that, so does that mean there's no way out of this situation? No, there is a way out. Maybe a small way, maybe only one way, but it does exist. Hmm. Yes, it does exist. Memories. My esteem, John, Hitsman, please, Heitzman, please, make an effort to recall the very stages of your life, the stages that brought you pleasant sensations. And the most important thing is this. If there were times when you made a soulman promise to someone and didn't keep it, then try to keep it now. If at all possible, I ask you, for your own sake, 
for the sake of science, make an effort to recall the good times, even for just a few days. These monitors record the function of many of your organs. They record it every minute. If you start doing what I'm asking you to do, and if the monitors record positive results, then we'll have the chance to find a path back to health. Hmm. Yes, to find it, I will definitely find it. Or maybe you will find it. Or maybe the path itself. Life will find it. The professor stopped talking and looked once more at the hand of the man who lay there motionless. A second later, Heitzman characteristics gesture sent the professor on his way. Like many people, John Heitzman would sometime reminisce about the past. To some degrees, to some degree, he understood what the professor had been talking about. He could make an effort to find some good moments in his past, and maybe they really would have a positive effect. But the whole problem with this was that the life he'd lived didn't seem pleasant to him now. It seemed uninteresting and even pointless. Heisman recalled how he'd gotten married on the advice of his father to the daughter of a billionaire who added to their empire's wealth. The marriage didn't bring him any satisfaction. His wife turned out to be an inf infertile and after 10 years of married life, she died of a drug overdose. Then he married a famous young model. She played the role of a wife passionately in love with her husband. But after a mere six month of married life, Heisman's security staff presented him with photos of his wife coverting with his, her former lover. He didn't even talk to her about it. He just told security to arrange it so he'd never have to lay eye on her again. And so he had no memories of her. As he remises, husband came to the period when he began working for his father's empire and he couldn't identify a single pleasant moment where he felt like stopping to take in some positive emotions. There was only one pleasant moment when he proved to his father that they didn't need to be the sole owner of the monetary fund. The other investors who were contributing to their own capital to the fund and who wanted to increase that capital would expend their own mental energy on increasing the overall capital of the fund. And that meant those investors were working for them, for the Heismans. His father thought this over for several days. Then one day at dinner, this father was, who was so stingy with his prey said, I agree to your proposal regarding the fund, Johnny. It's correct. Good for you. Give some thought to what other direc directions we should be heading in. Give some thought to what other direction we should be heading in. It's time for you to take the helm. For several days, John Heisman felt exhilarated. And as a result, he was able to make several more decisions that increased the financial empire profit. Even so, he didn't experience any particular joy. The reports noting larger profits than before were devoid of emotion. There was no one left to praise him. His father had died, and the praise of one's sobernets brings no joy. And so John Heisman traveled back in his recollections to his childhood. His memory, his memory listlessly elim eliminated the rare moments of contact with his father. More often than, that, than not, John's strict father would reprimand him in the presence of the nannies and tutors assigned to him. Then suddenly something like a wave of warmth flowed through the body of the billionaire who was lying there motionless. His body twitched with a pleasant sensation. A very sharp and clear picture arose in Heisman's recollections. A far corner of the garden, surrounded by 
acai tree stood a little house about two meters high with one tiny window. A yearning that one can entirely understand. The yearning nearly every child possess to create his own little home, his own space. This yearning has nothing to do with whether the child has his own separate room in his parents' house or shares a room with his parents. Nearly every child goes through a period when he begins to build his own little corner of the world with his own two hands. Clearly a person has a gene that stores some kind of very ancient information and it says to him, you need to create your own space on your own. And the person, a child, heeding this call that has come to him from the depths of eternity begins to construct it. And even if it can't ever compare to today's mentions, all the same, the person will feel more serene in this spot that he's made for himself than he will in any mansion. And so nine-year-old John Heitzman, who had two spacious room in his family's country house at his disposal, nonetheless decided to build himself a little house with his own two hands. He built it out of plastic seedling pots. These pots ended up being very suitable for building. They came in a variety of colors. John used blue pots for the walls and then made a strip border that ran all the way around the perimeter, perimeter of some yellow ones. He set out the pots one inside the other and they slip into the little grooves, grooves fastening themselves together. John laid one of the walls by laying the pots on top of each other on their sides. So the bottoms face out and on the inside. It made a whole wall full of shelves for the roof of this little house, of his little house. John used boards, which he then covered with plastic sheeting and fastened to the board using a stapler. He spent a whole week building his little house, making use of the three hours allotted to him each day for being out in the fresh air. On the seventh day, as soon as it was time for his walk, Johnny immediately set off for his creation in the far corner of the garden. Pulling aside the acai branches, he glimpsed the little house he built and then stopped in surprise. A little girl was standing next to the entrance to the house and looking inside his creation. The little girl was wearing a light blue skirt that reached below her knees and a white top with frilled sleeves. Ringlets of chestnut hair fell to her shoulders. At first, Johnny felt jealous to see some stranger here by his creation, and he couldn't help but ask, what are you doing here? The little girl turned her beautiful little face in Johnny's direction and answered, I'm admiring. What? This marvelous and smart little house. What? What kind? Johnny asked again, astonished. Marvelous and smart, the little girl repeated. Houses can be marvelous, but I've never heard of one being smart. Only people can be smart, Johnny noted seriously. Well, of course, people can be smart. And when a smart person makes a little house, then the house is smart too, the girl objected. What do you think is so smart about this house? That wall inside it is very smart. It has a real lot of little shelves. You should put a lot of things you need on those shelves and toys too. Johnny liked the way the little girl thought her remarks flattered him, and maybe he liked the little girl too. She's pretty and she's smart thinker, Johnny thought to himself. Then he said out loud, I've built this little house. Then he immediately asked, what's your name? I'm Sally. I'm seven years old. I live here in the servant's house because my daddy is the gardener here. He knows a lot about plants and is teaching me about them. I know how to grow flowers already too and how to 
graft branches onto trees. So what's your name and where do you live? I live in the country house. My name is Shani. So you're the owner, sons? Yes, his son. Come on, Johnny, let's play in the little house together. How should we play? We'll play that we live in the, in the house just like grown-ups do. You'll be the owner since you're the owner's son and I'll be your servant since my father's one of the servants. That won't work, Johnny noted. A servant has to live in the servant's quarters. Only the husband, the wife, and their children can live in the country house. Then I'll be your wife, Sally blurted out and then asked, can I be your wife for a while, Johnny? Johnny didn't answer. He went inside the house, looked around, then turned towards Sally, who was still standing outside the doorway and answered casually, okay, come on and, and pretend you're my wife. We have to think how to set things up inside. Sally came into the little house, looked into Johnny's eyes with tenderness and delight and said, almost whispered, thank you, Johnny, I'll try to be a good wife. Johnny didn't visit his little house every day. He wasn't always allowed to play in the garden during walk time. Accompanied by bodyguards, he'd visit the city park or Disneyland or go horseback riding. But almost every time he did manage to visit the house, Sally was there waiting for him. And each time he came, Johnny was interested to see what had changed in the little house. First, a throw rug Sally had bought appeared on the floor, then little curtains on the window opening over the entrance. Then he noticed a little round child's table with an empty picture frame, and Sally said, You come to our house less and less all the time, Johnny. I wait for you, but you don't come. Why don't you give me your picture, and I'll put it in this little frame. I'll look at your picture, and that way it will be more fun for it will be more fun for to wait for you. When Johnny came to say goodbye to the little house and to Sally, he left his folder there. He and his parents were moving to another country house. John Heisman, multi-billionaire, lay in bed in his suite and smiled as he recalled more and more details about the time he spent as a child with the little girl, Sally. Only now did he realize that this little girl had loved him. He was her first love, and her love was childish, reckless, and unrequited. Maybe he had loved her too, or maybe he had just liked her. But she had loved him in a way that most likely no one else in his whole life ever had. And so now... Reminiscing about the little house he'd built in the garden, about his time spent with Sally, even now, pleasant warm feelings arose in him. These feelings warmed his body and he felt good. He saw Sally once, only once more after he moved away, 11 years later. But this encounter, some new feelings stirred throughout his body. John Heitzman Heitzman even raised himself up a bit in bed. His heart began pumping blood through his veins with ever greater force. That meeting, he'd forgotten about it. He never gave it any thought. But right now, he couldn't think of anything else. He couldn't think of anything else. And the very thought of it agitated him. He went back to the estate where he spent his childhood 11 years later. For only one day, he didn't have time to stay longer. After lunch, he went out into the garden and somehow it happened that he found himself heading for the far corner of the garden where as a child he built his little house among the acai. He pulled aside the branches, stepped inside the little glade and stood there, stock still in surprise. The house he'd built 11 years earlier out of plastic pots were still standing in the very same spot as before. But all around it, around it were small flower beds and a path covered with sand led to the entrance. And a little bench now stood by the entrance and flower vines had entwined the little house itself. There wasn't a bench there before, but now 
There is. Grown-up Johnny noted to himself. He pulled aside the curtain that covered the entrance and bending over into the little house. He immediately sensed that someone had recently been there. The photograph of him as a boy stood on the table. As before, Sally's childhood toys were neatly arranged on the little shelves. A small bowl on one of the shelves next to the little table held fresh fruit. An inflatable mattress lay on the floor covered with a bedspread. John stood in the little house for 20 minutes or so, recalling the pleasant sensation from his childhood. He thought, why is this happening? Their family owned a lot of fancy country houses and they had a castle. But country houses and castles didn't produce the kind of pleasant feelings that arose here in the little house, made of ordinary plastic seeding pots, seedling pots. He saw Sally when he came out of the house. She was standing silently by the entrance, as if she couldn't bring herself to interrupt John's flood of memories. John glanced at her and Sally's cheeks flushed. She lowered her eyes in embarrassment and a soft, velvety voice that was unusually tender and excited, she said. Hello, Johnny. He didn't answer right away. He stood there admiring the grown-up Sally's unusual, beautiful body. Her light dress that hugged her figure fluttered in the breeze. Through the dress, he could see the lines of her lift, the young woman's figure. She was no longer a child. Hi, Sally, John said, interrupting the lengthy pause. So you're still keeping things in order around here? Yes, after all, I promised. There's some fruit there. It's been washed, have some, it's for you. Ah, yes, for me. Well, okay, let's go in together and we'll have something to eat. John pulled aside the curtain and let Sally go ahead of him. She went in, squatted down to pick up the bowl and put it on the table next to the frame photo. There were no chairs in the little house, so John took a seat on the rug. Reaching for a bunch of grapes, he brushed against Sally's shoulder. She turned, their eyes met, and Sally took a quick, quick deep breath. A button on the dresser top, her firm breast came undone when she breathed in sharply. John took Sally by the shoulder and drew her to him. She offered no resistance, quite the opposite. She pressed herself to him with the entirety, entirety of her burning body, and she did not resist when John slowly and carefully laid her down atop the rug or when he caressed and kissed her lips and her breasts, or when he. Sally was a virgin. Never before had John been intimate with a virgin, nor was he ever again. And now, 45 years after that last encounter with Sally, John Heitzman suddenly understood that this was the only time he had ever experienced truly beautiful, mind-blowing intimacy with a, with a woman, or rather with a girl whom he made a woman. Afterwards, they fell asleep for a short while. When they awoke, they talk about something. About what? John Heisman strained his memory. He really wanted to remember at least part of this conversation, and he did. Sally was talking about how wonderful life was. She told him how her father was saving up to buy her a plot of land and that he might, if there was enough money, build her a little house. Sally herself would do all the landscape design in the plot, would put in a lot of different plants and would live there happily raising her children. John made a mental note then to help Sally. Amazing, he thought to himself back then. All this girl needs to be happy is some plot of land and a little house. Why, that's nothing at all. I have to remember to help her get that land and a house too. But John forgot about his desire. Basically, he forgot about Sally. Life infatuated him with its delights. A new yacht, 
and his own jet brought him joy for the first few days. Then for a long time, only the game of high finance infatuated him. Infatuated him and added billions to his father's fortune, the fortune he would subsequently inherit. This infatuation, which agitated his emotions and strained his nerves, lasted for more than 20 years. It dominated everything else. He went, through first one, he went through first one marriage and then another as if they were just digressions. His wives left behind no trace of themselves. After 45 years, playing the financial game no longer brought him any satisfaction. And he began to experience episodes of depression, which grew more and more frequent, ultimately leading to a profound depressive crisis. But right now, John Heisman was not feeling depressed. Reminiscing about Sally had stirred him in a pleasant way, and it had annoyed him too. How did that happen? I made a promise to myself to help Sally, the girl who loved me, acquire a plot of land in a house, and then I forgot. John Heisman, who was used to keeping his promise, promises, particularly ones he'd made to himself, knew one thing for sure. His annoyance at himself wouldn't pass until he pushed a button to call his secretary. When the sec secretary entered, John Heisman, who was now sitting on the bed, spoke for the first time in six months, pronouncing the words with difficulty. A little more than 50 years ago, I live in a country house. I don't recall the exact address. You'll find it in the records. There was a gardener who worked at the country house. I don't recall his last name, but you'll find it in the accountant's file. The gardener had a daughter. Her name was Sally. Find out where Sally lives now. I need this information no later than tomorrow morning. If you get the information sooner, deliver it to me immediately, no matter what time it is. Make it happen. Sir, the gardener was let go 40 years ago and died not long afterwards. Before he died, he managed to buy two hectares of land on an abandoned ranch in the state of Texas. He started to build a house on that land, over-exerted himself during construction, and died. His daughter Sally finished building the house and now lives in it. Here is the address. We haven't been able to get any information as of yet. But all you need to do is tell us and we'll get you all the information you need. John Heisman took the slip of paper from the secretary, read it carefully, then neatly folded it up, placed it in his inside jack jacket pocket and said, have the helicopter ready to take off in 30 minutes. It will need to land five to 10 kilometers from the house in Texas. Have a car meet me at the landing spot, not a luxury ca car. No security, just a driver. Make it happen. At three o'clock in the afternoon, John Heisman, limping and leaning on a cane, made his way along a crushed stone pathway to a small cottage, overgrown with greenery. At first, he saw her from behind. An elderly woman was standing on a small ladder, washing a window. John Heisman stopped and began to look at this woman with the beautiful salt and pepper hair. She sensed his gaze and turned in his direction. She peered for a bit at the old man standing on her path, then suddenly hopped off the ladder and began running toward him. She ran with ease. This woman did not look old at all. She stopped about a meter from John Heisman. In a soft, excited voice, she said, Hello, Johnny. She immediately dropped her eyes, covering her flushed cheeks with both her hands. Hello, Sally, John Heitzman said, and then fell silent, or rather, he spoke, but only to himself, not out loud. How beautiful you are, Sally, and your shining eyes. 
and the tiny wrinkles next to them are so beautiful too. You are just as beautiful and kind, aloud he said. I was just passing through Sally and I found out, well, that you lived here, so I decided to visit you and maybe stay the night if that won't put you out. I'm very happy to see you, Johnny. Of course, do stay the night. I'm here alone for now. Tomorrow they're bringing my grandchildren to spend a week with me. There are two of them. My granddaughter is nine years old and my grandson is already 12. Come along into the house, Johnny. I'll give you an infusion to drink. I know just what kind of infusion you need. Come along. So that means you were married, Sally. You have children. I still am married, Johnny. We had one son and now two grandchildren. Sally replied joyfully. Why don't you have a seat at the table in the gazebo and I'll bring you your infusion. John Hitzman took a seat. Heitzman took a seat on a plastic lawn chair out on the house veranda. And when Sally brought him a large wine glass with some infusion, he asked, Sally, why did you say you knew just what kind of infusion I needed? Well, my father would gather herbs and dry them and then make infusions for your father. And they would help your father. I learned to gather herbs too. And my dad told me that you have the same hereditary illness as your father, Johnny. But now, how did you know when I come to visit? I didn't know, Johnny, you see. I gathered the herbs just in case. So, Johnny, how did your life turn out what do you do? My life's taken various twists and turns. I've done this and that, but I don't feel like remembering that now. It feels good here with you, with you. Sally, it's beautiful. You have a lot of flowers, a garden. Yes, it feels good here. I like it very much. The only thing is, do you see over there to the right? They've started building something there. It's going to be a garbage processing plant. And they want to build some kind of factory there on the left, too. And they want us to move somewhere else. But your trip must have tired you out. It's clear you've come a long way, Johnny. I see how tired you are. I'll make a bed up for you by the open window. And you go lie down and have a good rest. Just drink up your infusion first. John Heitzman, Hitzman had a difficult time getting undressed. He really was tired. His muscles atrophied from lying motionlessly for six months could barely keep him on his feet. It was hard for him to pull the blanket up over himself. But once he had, he went right to sleep. These days, he usually couldn't get to sleep at all without a sleeping pill, but here he went right to sleep. He didn't see the morning at all because he awoke only at noon. He took a shower and went out into the veranda. Sally was getting lunch ready in the summer kitchen, and a little boy and a girl were helping her. Good afternoon, Johnny. I can see you slept well. You look like you've grown so much younger. Here, meet my grandchildren. This is Emmy, and this young man's name is George. And I'm John Heitzman. Good morning, he said, extending his hand to the little boy. Good. Now, if you've gotten acquainted, while Emmy and I make lunch, why don't you men have a walk around the garden and work up your appetite, Sally suggested. I can show you the garden, George said to Heisman. The old man and the little boy strolled through the beautiful garden. The boy pointed out various plants and talked nonstop about all their properties. Heisman was busy thinking his own thoughts. When they reached the end of the garden, the boy announced, and here behind this acai tree is my mansion. 
crime I built it. Heisman moved a branch aside and saw. In the small glades beyond the acai stood his little house, made of the same plastic ceiling pots. Only the roof was made differently, and the curtain covering the entrance was different. Heisman moved the curtain aside, bent over a bit, and stepped into the little house. Everything was arranged just like before, except that on the table there was a photograph pressed between two sheets of plexiglass. It was a photo of Sally's grandson. Just as it should be, John Heisman thought, the house has a different master now, and a different photo too. Heisman picked up the photo and just to have something to say, said, You came out well in this picture, George. But that's not a picture of me, Uncle John. That's a picture of the little boy Grandma was friend with when she was little. He just happens to look like me. A limping John Heisman was trying to move along the garden path as quickly as he could leaning on his stick and stumbling at, as he went. He went up to Sally and breathing quickly, a bit confused, he asked. And where is he now? Where is your husband now, Sally? Where is he? John, please calm down. It's not good for you to be agitated. Please sit down, Sally said softly. You see, John, it just so happened that way. When I was a child, I promised a certain very good little boy that I would be his wife. But we were just playing. John practically shouted, jumping up from his chair. We were just children playing. Be that as it may, let's just say that I'm still playing. And then I'm pretending you're my husband, Sally said, and quietly added. My husband and my beloved, George, looked a lot like me when I was a boy. Does that mean you had a baby after that night, Sally? Did you have a baby? Yes. I had our son, John. He looks like me, but he has your very strong genes, and our grandson is like a copy of you. John Hitzman looks back and forth between Sally and the little boy and girl who were setting the table on the veranda, and he couldn't say another word. His thinking and his feelings were all confused. And for some reason, he himself didn't understand. He said, speaking sternly, I have to leave right now, right away. Goodbye, Sally. He took two steps down the path, turned around and walked up to Sally, who was standing there silently. John Heisman, struggling and leaning on his cane, went down on one knee before Sally, took her hand and slowly kissed it. Sally, I have something very important to do, something I can't put off. I have to leave right now. She laid her hand on his head and tousled his hair a bit. Yes, of course, if you have important things to do, problems to solve, then you need to go. If things get difficult for you, John, then come here to us. Our son owns a small company now. It's got a lovely name, Lotus, and they do landscape design work. He doesn't have any special training, but I taught him myself. And he's come up with some very talented projects and he can barely keep up with the work. He helps me out with money and comes to visit me every month. I imagine you must be having money problems and a few health problems too. Come see us, John. I know how to get your health back and we'll have enough money. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. I have to get there in time. I have two. He walked along the path to the exit, lost in thought about his plan, and Sally watched John's receding figure and whispered to him herself, Come back, my love. And an hour later, she repeated, repeated this phrase once more as an incantation. She forgot all about her grandchildren, and she didn't notice a helicopter circling for more than half an hour up above her plot of land with its little house and beautiful garden. John Hitzman's helicopter hadn't even landed on the roof of his office building yet, but
but his closest assistants and secretaries were already waiting in the meeting room, feverishly checking their figures and preparing to report to their boss. They were no longer used to having him present at their meetings, and so now they await their boss with a certain degree of trepidation and fright. John Hetzman came in and everyone stood up. He started speaking before he even got into his spot at the head of the table. Take your seats, no reports, listen carefully because I'm not going to repeat anything. There's no time for that. So, there's a country estate in Texas. Texas. Here's, its, uh, here's its address. I instruct you to buy up all the land within a hundred mile radius of the estate. Buy up all the industrial complexes located on that land, even if you have to pay three times what they're worth. Those of you who handle real estate transactions can leave and get the operation moving immediately. If need be, put all your agents to work. This operation should take no more than one week. One of the assistants jumped up and hurriedly headed for the exit. John Hetzman, Hetzman continued. All of the buildings, factories, and plants on those lands are to be demolished within no more than a month's time, even if you need to bring in hundreds of construction companies to do it. Within a month, the area where they once stood needs to be seeded with grass. John Hitzman addressed the sole remaining assistant in the room. There's a small company in Texas with the beautiful name of Lotus. Execute a five-year contract with them. Put them in charge of drawing up plans for a settlement to be located on all the land we acquire surrounding that state in Texas. Whatever price they ask for, double it, make it happen. Two weeks later, John Hetzman was addressing a crowd of 1,500 people. The landscape designers, botanists, and agronomists in the audience had made their way to this auditorium to inform aid agencies. All of them were hoping to get work, especially since the ad had specified a contract price that was twice what they usually earned. John Hitzman came out on stage and began speaking in his usual categorical and even slightly gruff way. In accordance with the contracts presented to you, each of you will be allotted irrevocable lifetime use of a plot of land, two hectares in size. You will given several designs of prefabricated homes to choose from. And these homes will be built on each plot on the spot you specify at our company's expense. Every year for five years, our company will pay out the sum of money specified in the contract to each adult member of the family. Your task is to develop this territory granted to you for lifetime use, to plant gardens and flower beds, to dig ponds and lay out paths, to make everything lovely and good. Our company will cover the cost of all saplings and any seeds you request. That's all I have to say. If there are no questions, those who wish to do so can come sign their contracts. But complete silence reign in this audience of 1,500 people. Not a single person rose up from his seat to approach the little tables, where secretaries sat with the contract awaiting signatures. After a minute of complete silence, the elder man rose, elderly man rose from his seat and asked, Tell me, sir, this location you're suggesting we move to, is it lethal, lethally contaminated? No answer, one of Heisman's second assistants. On the contrary, this location is exceptionally environmentally pure, and its land is suitable, product, productive. Then tell us, be honest, what kind of experiment experiment are you planning to carry out on people? Asked a young woman, jumping up from her seat. Many of us have children, and I, for one, have no intention of subjecting my child to who knows what kind of experiment. The audience began to buzz, and cries of opportunists, inhumane, and monsters began to be heard. People began getting up from their seats, and one by one, they began leaving the auditorium. Heidsman assistant tried to offer some explanation to answer some of people's questions, but in vain. Heidsman watched hopelessly as people flowed out of the auditorium. He stood, he understood that if they left, that would be the end of his hope, or even the end of more than that. 
he so wanted to do something nice for Sally, for his son and his grandchildren. He didn't want there to be any sm smokestacks next to Sally's cozy country house. He wanted there to be gardens blooming and kind neighbors living around her. He brought up the land and on his orders, they torn the smokestacks down and they sown grass. But the only way the land could improve was if good people came to live on it. But they were leaving. They hadn't understood. And how could they understand? How could they believe? Stop. Suddenly it dawned on Heisman. They didn't believe because they didn't know anything. What if he were to tell them the truth? John Heisman stood up and quietly, hesitantly, at first began speaking. People I understand, I have to explain what's motivating my company to take these actions. But it's impossible to explain, totally impossible. That's because I, you see, my motivation, or rather all of these contracts are very important to me personally. Or how should I put it? Heisman got confused and wasn't sure how to continue. But the people had stopped. They were standing in the aisles and in the doorways of the exits, and they were looking intently at Heisman. They were saying a word, and he wasn't sure what to say next. Even so, he pulled himself together, and he went on. When I was a child, when I was a young man, I came to love a certain girl. But back then, I didn't realize I loved her. I married other women, had a business. This girl and I didn't see each other for 50 years. I didn't remember about her. But not long ago, I remembered about her. I understood that she was the only person who had ever sincerely loved me and still loves me. But I didn't know that then. I didn't even remember her. And I also understood that she was the only person I could ever love. I met with this girl. Of course, now she's already of an age. But to me, she's the same as she used to be. She loves her garden. She does everything beautifully. And I wanted her to be surrounded by beauty and good neighbors. It would be better if good, happy neighbors, neighbors live nearby. But how could I make that happen? I was a businessman, and I'd accumulated a certain sum of money, so I bought the land and divided it up into plots and thought up these contracts here. And I did this for my beloved, or maybe I did it for myself. John Heisman pronounced his last phrase as if he were asking himself. And as he went on, he spoke as if he didn't even see the people before him as if he was discussing it with himself out loud. We live for some reason, for what reason? We're striving for something, for what? I'll die soon, and what will I leave behind? Nothing but decay. But now I'm determined not to die before I make my project a reality. I will leave behind something eternal. I'll leave behind a garden for my beloved. I'll leave behind gardens at first, I just wanted to hire a lot of workers a contract with a big landscape design company. Contract with them to look after the plantings. But then I realized beauty ends. Sterile somehow, if it isn't somebody's. And so I decided it should be somebody's. So that's why I'm giving you plot of land and houses. And all I'm asking for in return is for beauty all around my beloved. You, did, you didn't believe that the terms were offering you and the contracts were real. You didn't understand what our goal is in offering these contracts. Now you know. John Hitzman fell silent. The people standing in the room were silent too. The first one to break the silence was the woman who'd been most vehement in expressing her distress. First, she quickly walked to the, to the row of tables by the wall where the contracts were laid out, asked one of the secretaries to enter her name and sign the contract without even reading it. 
Then she turned to the people in the room and said, Yes, I signed it. I was the first to sign. I'll go down in history for that because I am the first. Just think about it. No man, no matter how rich he might be, has ever given a greater gift to his beloved than that man standing on stage here. There's no greater gift you could give. No one's ever been able to think of anything greater than that. Not in the entire known history of mankind. Another woman shouted out from the audience. I love you called out a third. I want a plot next to your beloved. What's her name? Asked a fourth. Her name is Heisman began and then went on. Well, maybe she doesn't need to know about this. Let her think that this is just the way the fates decree. Moving as one, the people in the room rushed to the tables by the wall. A line formed. People were joking happily and calling each other as nothing less than neighbors. But the great majority of them, especially the women, were directing their gaze, shining with love at the man standing on the stage. For the first time in his life, John Heitzman personally experienced the energy of kindness, love, and sincere, sincere delight emanating from a great number of human souls. A healing energy capable of vanquishing everything, any ailments. When he left the stage, he was no longer limp limping. And during the next several months, he personally took an active part in making sure. He personally took an active part in making sure the factories on the land he bought were torn down. Personally discussed the details of the plans for the entire settlement around Sally's estate. Personally consulted about the landscaping options for each separate plot as well as the entire infrastructure. When after a year, he once again walked up to the gate of Sally's estate, all around as far as the eye could see, people were already planting large gardens of small saplings. And near Sally gate, he saw several saplings with carefully wrapped root balls. Sally seemed to have sensed his arrival and ran to meet him. John, it's so good you've come. So good. Hello, John. She ran up to him, fast and ardent as a girl. She seized John's hand and dragged him in to have some tea, all the while happily talking nonstop. You know, John, what a miraculous thing is going on around here. I'm so happy. They're usually happy there aren't going to be any smoke sh um, stacks near our house anymore. And we'll have nice neighbors. Life is so full to bursting all around. So full. Don't you worry if things aren't going well with your, with your business, Sean. Say the heck with everything and come live here. We're rich now. Our son got a lucrative contract, actually an unusual lucrative contract. Now he's in charge of the landscape design and planning for the whole project here. And we've gotten a little more land too. Our son's going to build himself a new house there. And if you want, you and I will live here. I do want to, John Heitzman answered and added, thank you for the invitation, Sally. But why are you going to live in an old house? Rang out a voice behind John Heitzman. He turned and saw his son. He knew right away that this was his son. And the young man continued, so I gather that you're my father. When Georgie told me how you thought the photo of mom's child friend was a photo of him, then I figured out we'd come to visit. And besides, mom never been good at hiding her feelings. Of course, I don't feel the same way mom does about you and I yet, but I'm prepared to finance the construction of a new cottage for my happy parents. Thank you, son, John Heitzman replied, holding back. He wanted to, to go embrace his son, but for some reason he hesitated. The young man took the first step, putting his hand out. He introduced himself. John, this is great. It's wonderful now you've met. When you get to know each other a little better, then you like each other. But for now, let's go have some tea, said Sally. And at the table, Sally once again excitedly talked nonstop about all the unusual going on in recent months. 
you can't imagine, Chan. Just try to imagine the story they're telling around here. It's like the most beautiful fairy tale in the world. A life fairy tale come to life. Just imagine, John. People are saying that one person bought up all this land around here. Then this person invited the best landscape designers, agronomists, and gardeners, and he gave each of them total three several hectares of land that's theirs to use for as long as they live. He told them to make their plots lovely, and he gave them all the saplings and seeds free of charge. And on top of that, he's going to pay for all beautification of those plots of theirs for five years. Just imagine on top of it all, he's going to pay. This person put every last penny he had into this project. Well, maybe not every last penny has been objected, but that's what people say, every last penny. And do you know why he's doing all of this? Why, John has been asked calmly. Now, this is the really beautiful part of, what, of what's going on here. He did this so that his beloved would be able to live surrounded by all this beauty. They say she also does landscape design and that she's, she'll also have an estate somewhere around here. But no one knows where she is and who she is. Can you imagine what will happen when people find out who she is? What? What do you mean, what? Everyone will want to get a good look at her right away and even touch her as if she was some kind of goddess. Me personally, I like to touch her. She must be a very unusual person. Maybe she looks unusual on the outside or maybe she's unusual inside. Not a single woman in the world could inspire a man to do such an unusual and lovely thing. That's what everyone around here is saying. So everybody is going to want to see this man and his unusual woman and touch them, even. I imagine they will, John has been agreed. And then he added, so what should we do about that, Sally? Why we, Sally acts in amazement? Because that unusual woman, the one for whose sake everything's going on around here is you, Sally. Sally looked at John without blinking, trying to make sense of what she heard. Something sank in and the teacup fell from her hand. But no one paid any attention to the sound of the breaking cup. John Heisman turned at the sound of a falling chair and saw that his son had impulsively sprung from his seat. John Jr. went up to his father and speaking on a soft baritone said excitedly, Father, father, can I hug you? John Heisman hugged his son first and heard the beating of his heart. John Jr. embraced his father and whispered, elated, I've never heard of anyone declaring his love in such a powerful way. Without any words at all, not anywhere in the world, I'm so proud. I admire you, Father. When Father and Son turned toward Sally, she was still taking everything in. Suddenly, her cheeks flushed, and it was if it smoothed out her wrinkles. Teardro teardrops began flowing from her eyes. Embarrassed at her tears, Sally went right up to John Sr., seized his hand and led him toward the door to the veranda. John Jr. watched as his parents, hand in hand, set off along the path leading to the Asai, behind which stood their little childhood house. They walked slowly at first, then suddenly set off running toward the Asai, just like teenagers. Ten years later, John Heisman, who'd grown younger now, was sitting in the club cafe along with other men from the community. Laughing, he explained to them, listen, there's no way I'm going to run for president. Don't even try to convince me. And it has nothing to do with my age. You can run a country without being a president. You can run a country from your own garden. Look, You've shown by your own example how to build a real life. 
and all of America is turning into a blooming garden now. If it keeps on going like this, maybe we'll catch up to Russia. We will catch up. We will. Sally asserted walking in. But right now, Johnny, let's please go home. The little one doesn't want to go to sleep without you. Then she added, whispering in his ear. And neither do I. A pair of young people, John Heisman and Sally, walk hand in hand along the shady, sweetly scented alley toward their house. In the spring, it always seemed to them that their life was only beginning the way real life was beginning all across America. City on the Neva from the book by Vladimir McGrath, Who Are We? Translated by Marianne Schwartz. At the corner of the Fontanka River's embark embankment and Neves Prospect, builders were digging a trench and an 11 year old boy accidentally fell into it and hurt his leg. For a long time, while he was unable to walk, he sat by the window in his apartment at number 25, which is on the Fountanka River embankment. The apartment's windows, windows looked out on the courtyard, not the river. Opposite the window was a shabby brick wall and built onto it was a building with rust spots on the roof. One day, the boy asked his father, Papa, is our city considered the best in the country? Of course, the father answered his son, and one of the best in the world too. But why is it the best? What do you mean, why? It has all kinds of monuments and museums, and the architecture in the city center de delights everyone. But we live in the center too, and all we see out the window is a shabby wall and a rusty roof. The wall? Well, yes. We're a little out of luck with the view from our window. Are we the only ones? There may be someone else, but for the most part, the boy photographed the view from the window of his apartment. And when he was able to go back to school, he showed the photograph to his friends. All the children in his class took picture of the view from the window of their apartments and compared photographs. The overall picture did not delight the eye. The boy and his friends friends went to the newspaper's editor and asked him the question. He had first asked his father, why is our city considered more beautiful than others? They tried to explain to him about the Alexander Column and the Hermitage. They talk about Kazan Cathedral and the legendary Nevesk Prospect. What makes Nevesk beautiful? The boy persists with his question. I think it looks like a stone trench with flaking edges. They tried to explain to him the merits of the architect and spoke about the sculpting of the fac on the facades. They told him that the city did not have enough money yet to restore all the buildings at once, but soon it would, it would and then everyone would see how beautiful Neves was. But can a stone trench really be beautiful, even if it has renovated sculpting? Not only that, it's soon going to start peeling and someone again will fill in the holes and shore up what's falling down. The boy and his friends went from edit editorial office to editorial office, showed their now huge collection of photographs with different views and asked the same question his persistence irritated the journalists at first. One day, a reporter for a youth newspaper told him in the hallway, you've come to see us again and you drag your fellow champions along with you and you have more and more of them. 
You don't like the city or the views from your windows, but can you do anything at all? We don't need you to criticize. March back to your homes. Don't get in our way. An old journalist heard the stern conversation with the children too. Watching the group of children proceeding to the exit, he told the young reporter thoughtfully, you know, for some reason, their persistence reminds me of a fairy tale. A fairy tale? Which one? The reporter asks. The emperor's new clothes. And it, a boy says. The emperor has no clothes. The boy did not bother the newspapers with his question anymore and no longer took his many photographs out of his school bag to show them. One school year ended and another began. The news spread to all the newspapers that the boy had shown up once again, accompanied by his friends, accompanied by his friends. Admiringly, the old editor told his colleagues in the House of Journalists the story for the umpteenth time. He showed up. Yes, imagine. He got into the waiting room and not alone. A few of them sat quietly for a few hours in the waiting room and I saw them. I warned them to talk fast and they fit it into two minutes. They wanted and unfolded a sheet of what men on I look at their masterpiece and was speechless. I couldn't tear my eyes away. Two minutes have passed in this way because the boy told everyone, time for us to go. Our time here is run out. What's this? I exclaim as they walk out the door. He turned around and I felt the gaze of another era on me. Yes, we still have a lot to make sense of. Yes. Well, did he say anything at all? Yes. Don't keep us waiting. Is he planning to come again? Those gathered acts. And the old editor replied. He turned around and said, Our Neves is before you. Right now, it's just a drawing. Later, the whole city will be like that. And the door shut. For the upteenth time, the journalist leaned over the plan and admired its marvelous beauty. The buildings on Neves Prospect no longer greeted one another, forming a solid stone wall. Some of the old buildings remained and every other building was removed. And the space and the spaces formed between the buildings were magnificent green oases, birds nest and the birches, pines and cedars. And it seemed to those looking at the picture that they could hear the singing. People sat on benches under the treetops and they were surrounded by beautiful flowering shrubs and bushes of raspberries and currants. The green oases edged out into the avenue and Neves now looked like a marvelous living green land rather than a stone trench. Many mirrors were installed in the building for cats, for kids. They reflected thousands of sunbeams, playing with the passerby, caressing the flower's petals, sparkling in the streams of the small fountains built in each green oasis. People drank water with sunbeams and smiled. And the boy left for good he became a great architect. He and his fellow champions created the beautiful cities and settlements of the future where happy people came to live. But his first beautiful creation on earth was the city he created on the Neva. Tells from the future. Give children a homeland. From the book by Vladimir McGrath, The Energy of Life. 
It's translated by Marianne Schwartz. In Ukraine, there is a city called Kharkov. In this city, there is a children home. It is a fine children home. Comfortable buildings, a handsome aquarium, a large pool. The local authorities made an effort and entrepreneurs help. The director of the Municipal Office of Public Education showed me the building and told me how the children from this home attended an ordinary school. I looked out the window. The children were coming back from school in groups. Just one little girl was walking apart from everyone else. That's Sonia. She's in the first grade, the director told me. She always walks along alone. She believes a Jewish family is going to adopt her soon. Why Jewish? She doesn't look like a Jewish child. She has blonde hair and looks more like a Ukrainian. Someone in school told her that Sonia is a Jewish name. So she's a Jew. Sonia agreed with this nationality and immediately decided she was definitely going to be adopted by a Jewish family. But she walks alone all the time because she thinks that if she walks in the group, her future parents won't be able to notice her. There is a fine children's home in Kharkov. There are children's homes in other cities in Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. Children live in them, and no matter how comfortable the buildings of these places are, the children dream of having parents, of belonging to a family. Skinny little first grader Sonia walk her purposeful walk across across the asphalt yard in her gray shoes separately from the others in children's home girl Sonia dream. One day passed, then two, then months. Sonia still didn't know that children's shelter have ex existed for a long time and in different countries and not all the children get adopted. Indeed, most of them are doomed to live without parents. Sonia was not adopted either. However, her life took an unusual turn. At, this at the same time, a group of people, residents of Krakow, decided to build a settlement not far from the city. They were able to obtain 150 hectares of land and 120 families each taking a hectare. We're allowed to, were allowed to found their own homesteads. One plot on the edge was left ownerless, and they decided to give it to some children's home child. As it happened, the choice fell on little Sonia. The child was brought by car along with her instructor to her plot. The instructor began explaining to the child, You see, Sonia, stakes have been hammered in and a string strung between them. Between Behind this string is your land, a whole hectare. It was given to you by people who have, all, who have also each taken a hectare of land next to you and will be planting gardens and building houses on them. When you grow up, you too can build a house and plant a garden. Your land will wait for you. The little girl walked up to the string, touched it, and asked the instructor, You mean past the string is my land, and past the string I can do everything I decide myself? Yes, dear Sonia, this is your land, and you alone can be in charge of everything that grows on it. But what, but what will grow on it? Well, for now, as you see, there are different grasses growing, 
but on the neighboring plots, look, people are already planting apple trees and pear trees and many other fruit trees, and they will soon have blooming orchards. When you grow up, you will decide what, what to plant, where on your land, so that, it's, so that it is beautiful the way the others are. Sonia leaned over and crawled under the string, unto her own hector of land, took a few steps along the string, string, looked closely at the grass and at everything bustling and chirping at it. She walked up to a small birch tree growing on the parcel, parcel allotted to her and touched it still slender trunk. She turned to her instructor and asked, for some reason, a little agitatedly, and the little tree, the birch tree, is that only mine too? Yes, dear Sonia, the birch tree too is now yours since it's growing on your land. When you get older, you can plant other trees here too. But now it's time for us to go. It will be din dinner soon and I have to be in the group. The girl turned to face her plot and looked at it in silence. Those who have children know that. While playing, children often mark off for themselves, improvise rooms out of various objects or build shelters in the country and play in them. For some reason, each child has a need to mark out his own small world from the larger world to create his own dimension. The children in the home have a shared dimension. The shared dimension, even if it is well arranged, has an oppressive effect on them. Sonia, like the other children, had never had her own corner, even a tiny one. Now she stood behind a string where everything was hers alone. The grass, the grasshoppers living in the grass and the little birch tree. The skinny little girl turned to her instructor. She began to speak in tones of prayers and resolve. I beg of you so, so much, please let me stay here. You go and I'll come back myself. How will you come back 30 kilo kilometers? I will, Sonia answered firmly. I'll walk and I'll get there. Maybe I'll take a bus. Please let me stay on my land alone. The Ziggly driver, also an owner of a plot of land near Sonia's, near Sonia's heard the conversation and made a suggestion. Let the girl stay here until this evening. I'll take you back and get, and get her home this evening. After thinking it over, the instructor agreed. She couldn't help but agree because she looked at the face of the little girl standing behind the string awaiting her decision. Fine, Sonia, you can stay here until evening. I'll send your dinner with the driver. There's no need to send it. The neighbor woman and I share dinner. The Ziggly driver said seriously, respectfully pronouncing the words. Neighbor woman. Listen, Quava. He shouted to them, women busy over dinner on the porch of a house under construction. Make dinner for four. Four. We'll have our neighbor with us today. Fine, the woman answered. There's enough for everyone. And she added, Sonia, you be sure to come to me if you need anything. Thank you, the perfectly happy Sonia replied. After the ziggly left, Sonia walked along the string, strung between the stakes. She walked slowly, sometimes stopping, sitting in the grass touching something with her little hands and walking again. In this way, she walked the pyramid of her entire parcel of land. 
Then she stood in the middle of the hector and surveyed all the sides of its boundary. And suddenly spreading her arms wide, she ran, jumped, and spun. After dinner, seeing how tired the little girl was, Clava suggested that she nap on a cot. But the weary Sanya replied, If you can give me some old clothing to spread out, I'll sleep on my own land next to the birch tree. Nikolaya set up a cot with a mattress and blanket next to the birch tree on Sanya's plot. The girl lay down and immediately fell into a deep sleep. This was her first slumber on her own homestead. What struck everyone at first as an insoluble problem arose at the children's home. Every day, Sanya asked the instructor, instructors to allow her to go to her Hector of land. Explanations that she was still too little to take the bus herself, and the instructors couldn't take her because they couldn't leave the other children, didn't help. Sanya began talking to the children's home director. She explained to the director that she absolutely absolutely had to go to her land. Had to because the people on the neighboring parcels were, parcels were already planting trees and they would soon have orchards blooming while her land looked aband abandoned. Nothing was going to bloom on it. In the end, the homes director found an acceptable solution for Sonia. Right now, we can't take you to your parcel, Sonia, since apart from everything else, we still have two weeks of study to go. In two weeks, vacation begins and I will speak with your neighbors. If they agree to look after you, then during the vacation, we will send you off to spend time on your parcel for a week or maybe more. By the way, you could spend these two weeks to the benefit of your land. Take these two brochures and read them. One talks about how to make fences and the other about the varieties of medicinal plants. If you behave well, I will also get you various seeds in time for vacation, for the, for the vacation. Sonia behaved well. She did her lesson, lesson assiduously, and all, absolutely all, of her free time she spent reading the two brochures given her by the director. When she went to bed, she imagined, pictured how prettily the different plants would grow in her parcel. One day, when all the children slept, the night aide noticed Sonia drawing trees and flowers in the moonlight that came through the window. Her neighbors agreed to look after the girl. And when the summer vacation came, the director himself helped load food supplies for two weeks, a shovel, a small rake and a packet of seeds into the zigella tree trunk. Nikolai didn't want to take the food from the children's home, but the director told him that Sanya was an independent girl and would never want to be burdened, never want to be a burden to anyone, and that it would be better if she saw that she had her own food. She was also given a new sleeping bag, even though the family of her neighbor Nikolai had prepared a small room and bed for the girl on the now furnished first floor of their house. When Sonia got in the car, not only the children's home staff working that day, but also many people who had come, especially to see the girl's face. Beaming with happiness, saw her off. The first three nights, Sonia slept in the room, set aside for her and her neighbor's, home, neighbor's house when she spent the entire day on her own Hector of land. The third day was Nikolai's birthday and many guests came to see him. One young couple came with their tent. The next day the guests left, but the tent stayed. This is a present for you, the young people told Nikolai. Sanya went up to Nikolai and asked to sleep in the tent. Nikolai gave his permission, of course. Sleep there if you want to so badly. It is stuffy for you in the room. Is it stuffy for you in the room? It's not 
It's nice in the room, the girl replied, but everyone is sleeping on their own land, and mine is left all alone at night. There are lights on many parcels, and mine is dark. You're saying you want me to move the tent and set it up on your parcel? Very much, Uncle Kolya, next to the birch tree. You have the time, and if, and if it's not too hard. All the following night, Sonia slept in the tent, pitched next to the birch tree on her Hector. Waking early in the morning, she immediately went over to the water bucket by her tent, scooped out a mug of water, and taking some into her mouth, released a thin stream of water into her open hands and washed up. And she took the album in which she had drawn herself the pictures of her ideal garden on the parcel and examined them. And she went to make her flower beds and fences. The small digging tool given her by the children home director was certainly sharp, but Sonia just could not push it all the way into the ground. She only had the strength to get it in halfway. However, her fences were turning out anyway. Her neighbor Nikolai offered to dig up the places. Sonia showed him on her Hector with his rototiller, but Sonia categorically refused. In general, she reacted jealously to any incursion, incursion on her Hector. People sense this and try not to cross the border marked out by stakes and the lines strung between them without the girl's knowledge. Even her neighbor, Nikolai, when he woke up in the morning to call Sanya to breakfast, only went as far as the string and called to Sanya from there. Some very unusual aspiration of the little girl for independence or fear of being burdened to anyone would not allow her to ask for anything. And even when one of the residents of the settlement tried to offer her clothing or candy or some other supply, she politely thanked them but categorically refused to take anything. And the two weeks she spent on her land, Sonia dug, dug, put in three fences, fences and made a large flower bed in the middle. On the morning of the last day of Sonia's two week stay on her land, Nikolai came as usual to the border of her parcel to call her to breakfast. The little girl was standing next to her flower bed, bed when nothing had come up yet, looked at it, and without turning around answered, Uncle Kolya, you don't need to call me to two meals today. I don't want to eat today. Nikolia would say that he sensed a certain anguish in the girl's voice, barely restrained sob but he did not try to discover what had happened. He went back home and began observing Sonia through his binoculars. The little girl was walking around her parcel, touching the plants and straightening the fences. Then she went to her birch tree, put her arms around it, and her little shoulders shook. The children home old minivan came for Sonia just before dinner. The driver stopped by the entrance to Nikolai homestead and honk. Nikolai recounted what happened then. When I watch her through my binoculars collecting her modest things, the spade and the rake and head downcast in our direction. When I saw her face through the binoculars, I couldn't stand it and grab my mobile phone. It's a good thing I was able to reach the children home director right away. I told him I could sign any documents and accept responsibility for the child. I would take leave and be on the parcel all the time, just so the little girl could be on her Hector to the end of vacation. At, the, at first, the director began to explain that all the children from their, from their children home were supposed to go for treatment and rest to a seaside children's camp. The home had been trying for this opportunity a long time, and now the children were going, thanks to their sponsor. I said something brusque to the director, but he, didn't, he, didn't, he did not take offense and responded equally curtly. Then he added, 
give the driver the phone, and tomorrow I'll come myself. I ran out, gave the driver the phone, and told him, Go on, friend. Get going quickly. The driver left. Sanyo, who had come up, asked, Uncle Kolya, was that our van coming for me? But why did it leave? For some reason, I was powerfully upset from my negoti- negotiations with the director. I lit a cigarette. My hands were shaking, and I said to her, Well, yes, they, they were here for you. They just came to ask whether you needed any food or anything else. And I told him we would get along. She looked at me closely, and I thought she understood something, and she said quietly, Thank you, Uncle Kolya. She started back again, and then ran quickly to her land. The children home director arrived in the morning, but I was already waiting for him. However, he went straight to the tent and not to see me. I didn't have time to tell him he had crossed the string without any invitation. But he did well and guessed himself. He also did well, obviously, not to traumatize the child. He said as soon as the girl came out to meet him, Good day, Sonia. I came by just to ask you something. We're going to the sea. What about you? Will you stay here or go to the sea with us? Here, Sonia didn't say, but shouted. That's what I thought, the director replied. That's why I brought you by way of food supplies. You mustn't worry or waste your time. I don't need anything. You don't? What would you have me do then? The state gives us money for each people, and you're going to raise yourself here and feed yourself? How would you have me account for the state money in that situation? No, you must take it. Be so kind. Come on, Alex. Unload it. Allow us to enter. Sonia, maybe you'll show me what you've been doing. For a while, Sonia looked at the director, trying to make full sense of the situation. Then she saw the van driver unloading heavy bags. And when she finally realized she was going to stay on her land until the end of vacation, she exclaimed joyfully, Oh, what am I doing? Come in. Here's the little gate. There's no string here. Please be my guest. I will show you what I've been doing. And you, Uncle Kolya, come in. She led us to her tent and immediately immediately offered us water to drink from the bucket standing by the tent. Here's the water. Here is the water. I get it from the spring. It tastes good, better than from the tap. Drink some, please. I won't refuse, the director reply, and scoping out half a mug, drink it with pleasure. It's good. I, too, had a drink, and so did the driver, and we praised Sonia's water to her great satisfaction. Probably for the first time in her life, Sonia possessed something all her own. Even if it was just water, it was hers. And for the first time, she could give something all her own to grown-ups. Sonia had begun to feel that she was part of the world. Then for an hour and a half, maybe even two, we listened to Sonia's enthusiastic story about what she had already planted, planted and what she planned to plant. She showed us her drawings of her future homestead. Only there was no little house in her drawing plans. Time for us to go, the the director told Sonia. You can unpack these things here yourself. I also bought you a battery-powered lamp. It can light for distance. But if you switch the lamp to daylight, then you can read. And now you will have something to read. I have bought you magazines on, on designing land and books on growing everything and on folk medicine. Oh, how could I forget? Get again, Sonia threw her hands up. I'll be right back. She folded back the tent flap and saw bundles of different herbs hanging on a string stretch across the tent. She took several bundles and held them out to the director. This is Celandine. 
It's a kind of herb. This is for Katya from our group. She needs to brew it and drink it. She's, she's sick a lot. I read about it. I read about it in the brochure you gave me. I tried it. Thank you. All in all, the director is a good man and loves the children. Later, he and I talk and he asked me about Sonia's behavior, behavior and gave me some practical advice. Sonia spent the whole summer in the tent on her hectare of land. Her flower bed bloomed in the middle with beautiful flowers. Onions, radish, and other things came up in her beds. In the evenings, when the days started getting shorter, you could often observe the light of the lamp flickering in the tent under the birch. Every evening, Sonia read the books on folk medicine and kept drawing in her album the future of her land. When at the end of the summer, the old van came to take her back to the children's home, I helped load Sonia's supplies. There was quite a lot to load. She had dried 200 or so bundles of herbs, a sack of potatoes, three melons. We really loaded up that van. I asked her, what about next year? Should I hold on to your tent? I'll definitely come for the next vacation. I'll come to my land the very first day. Thank you for being such a good neighbor, Uncle Kovia. She held out her hand, now much stronger to shake. Over the summer, too, Sonia herself not only had tan, but also had become stronger and more self-confident. She came the next year with fruit tree saplings and some seedlings and immediately got down to work. At an assembly, the people of our settlement decided to build Sonia a little house. Sina, the wife of an entrepreneur who had built the largest house, began to insist it not be small. Tells from the future, I will give birth to you, my angel. From the book by Vladimir Magra, The New Civilization, Part 1, translated by Susan Downing. Victor Chado, entrepreneur, awoke at dawn. Beside him on the, on the wide bed, his young lover was sweetly sleeping. The coverlet's thin fabric hugged her sculptured feminine figure. Whenever they appeared together at a banquet or in a hotel, at a fashionable resort, her figure would attract men, sometimes envious, sometimes lascivious gaze. Inga, that was the sleeping beauty's name. Inga also had an enchanting smile and impressed those around her as an intelligent, erudite woman. Victor liked spending time with her, which is why he bought himself a second floor room apartment, outfitted it with ultra modern furniture gave Inga the keys, and he'd sometimes spend a night or two with her there. When his intensive business permitted, he was grateful to this 25-year-old woman for those magnificent nights and for her company. But he had no plans to marry her. He didn't feel any particular love for Inga, and he also knew he was 38 and she was 25. Naturally, a few more years would pass and this young woman would want a younger lover. And with her looks and her brains, that wouldn't be difficult. And she'd find herself someone young and even wealthier. And it would all be thanks to him. Because by marrying her, he'd be giving her entry into the circle of influential businessmen. Inga turned toward him, smiling in her sleep, and the coverlet slid, partially revealing her alluring, perfectly formed breasts. But Victor Shadow 
didn't feel aroused the way he usually did. When he glimpsed her half-naked body, he carefully pulled the coverlet up over the sleeping Inga, quietly so he wouldn't wake her. He got up and went to the kitchen. He made some coffee and drank it. He lit a cigarette and as if lost in thought, began pacing back and forth across the spacious Ian kitchen. That dream, the unusual dream he'd had during the night had disturbed his feelings. Yes, his feelings, not his thoughts. Victor dreamed that he was walking along a shady path, intensely analyzing the feasibility of his latest commercial deal. His bodyguards, whose presence annoy him and prevent him from concentrating fully, were walking in front of and behind him. The continual noise of cars rushing along on the other side of the park fence also made it hard for him to get his thoughts together. Then suddenly, the bodyguards vanished and the noise of the cars faded. And he heard the singing of birds and saw how beautiful the spring foliage on the trees along the path and the flowering bushes were. He stopped, delighting in the serene feelings that had arisen within him, and he felt better than ever before in his life. And then he caught sight of a little boy running along a path toward him from far away. The sunlight illuminated, illuminated the boy from behind creating a halo around him. So it looked as if a little angel was running toward him along the path. In the next instant, it dawned on him. Running toward him was his little son. The boy was running toward him, working his little arms and legs hard. Victor crouched down and threw his arms open wide in joyful anticipation of an embrace. And his little son threw his little arms open as he ran too. Then suddenly, once he ran to within about three meters of Victor, the little one stopped running. The smile faded on the child's face and the serious expression on the child's eyes made Victor's heart beat more powerfully. Well, come on, come on. Come to me, come here. I'll give you a hug, little son. Smiling sadly, the little one answered. You won't be able to do that, Papa. Why not, the Victor astonished? Because... The little one answered. His voice fell with sadness. You can't hug me, Papa. Because you can't hug a son who's not been born. And you haven't given birth to me, Papa. Well, then you come here and give me a hug, son. Come here. It's impossible to hug a father who hasn't given birth to you. The little one tried his best to smile through his tears, but a single teardrop rolled slowly down his ruddy little cheek. Then the child turned and headed slowly and heavily off along the path, hanging his head. Victor remained kneeling, lacking the strength to move from the spot. The child was leaving, and the inner pleasant and serene feeling was leaving along with him. The whirl of the car of the war of the crowd of the cars began to grow once more. As if from far away, 
Victor couldn't move and he couldn't speak. But with his last ounce of strength, he shouted, Don't go, son. Where are you going? The child turned and Victor saw a second tear begin to fall. I'm headed for nowhere, Papa, for an endless nowhere. The little one cast down his eyes and was quiet. And then he added, Papa, I'm sad. That because I haven't been born. I can't help you be reborn through me. Hanging his head, the little angel receded from him. And before long, he had disappeared. As if he dissolved in the rays of the sun. The dream ended, but the memory, memory of the wonderful, serene sensation remained. They assumed to be urging, urging, urging him to take some kind of action. Victor finished smoking his third cigarette, put it out with a, sh with a sharp and decisive motion, then went into the bedroom saying loudly as he went, Wake up, Inga, wake up. Oh, I'm already awake. I've just been lying here. Luxurating and wondering where you've gotten to, responded the beauty, lying there on the bed. Inga, I want you to have a baby. Could you bear me a son? Throwing back the sheet, she jumped off the bed. She ran up to him wrap her arms around his neck, press her beautiful lift body to him and whispered passionately, the nicest, most beautiful way a man can declare his love is to ask a woman to bear his child. Thank you, if you're not kidding, that is. I'm not kidding, he replied firmly. Slipping on her robe, Inga replied, Well then, if you're not kidding, if you're serious, if so, then this is a spur of the moment decision. You haven't thought it through. First of all, I want my future child to have a father in his life, but you're married, my dear, my beloved. I'll get a divorce, Victor said, even though he'd actually already been divorced for three months. He just hadn't told Inga about it for a whole number of reasons. Get a divorce and then we'll talk about a baby. But I'll tell you right now, Victor, even if you do get a divorce, that still won't be the right time to talk about children. First of all, I still need a year to finish grad school. Second, I'm already so sick of school that once I do finish, I like to have a year or two to fool around, hang out at resorts, enjoy myself. But a baby, if I have kids, that'll be the end of that. Inga argued, half choking, half serious. Victor cut off her objections. Fine, I was choking. I have to go. I have an important meeting. I've already ordered the car. See you later. He left, but he wasn't going to a meeting, and he hadn't ordered any car. Victor walked slowly along the sidewalk, scrutinizing the woman, hurrying in his direction. He looked at them in a new, unfamiliar way that surprised even him. He was trying to pick out a woman who would be worthy of bearing him a son. A woman he'd want to have a baby with. All the stylish made up girls who used to attract him were out of the running right away. He totally rejected all the half naked ones and mini skirts or the ones wearing tight clothes showing off their figures. I know why they do that. I know what's on their mind 
and they're trying to look smart too, he noted to himself. They're using a variety of baits to attract the guys. And they'll see who bites. And they bite. Sure they do. Just not because they want to have children. A male would take that bait. But a parent won't. Go ahead. Shake your butts, you little fools. But there's no way a little wagtail like you bear my son. Two girls, two girls who happened to be coming toward him just then were smoking as they walked and one was holding an open bottle of beer. And those two, they're not at all fit for childbearing. Only an idiot would want to have a baby with them. Victor also noticed that very few of the women and girls coming his way were totally healthy. Some were stoop over and judging by some others' facial expressions, they must have stomach problems. Still others showed clear signs of obesity or anorexia. No, you can't have children with women like these, Victor thought to himself. Man, I'm sure every single one of these women dreams of having a Prince roll up to her in a white Mercedes, but they can't do the most basic thing for that prince. They can't give birth to a healthy child if they're not so healthy themselves. Instead of calling his driver, Victor took a trolley bus to his office, and the whole way there he scrutinized the woman he saw, trying to identify who from among them might be worthy to bear his son, but in vain. As the day progressed, even as he sat alone in his office during his lunch break, he didn't stop thinking about the woman who would bear his child. Every once he had the feeling that it was as if he was choosing a woman who would give birth to him himself. Finally, he came to the conclusion that he wouldn't be able to find the ideal mother for his son. He'd have to create her. To do that, he need to find a more or less healthy young woman of good character who was nice looking or at least not repulsive and create the right conditions for her to get all possible training and shore up her health had all the best spas. But the key would be to send her to study at the best possible school where she could receive information about how to pre prepare for pregnancy and how to go through pregnancy, where she could learn about childbirth and early childhood education. At the end of the workday, Victor called Valentina Petrovona into his office. She was the firm's lawyer and a woman with a wisdom born of rich life experience. He asked her to take a seat and begin a roundabout way. I have somewhat unusual question for you, Valentina Petrovona. It's well personal question, but it's of the utmost importance to me. A certain relative of mine asked me to find out. Well, you get, she's planning to get married and wants to have a child. She asked me to find out where in our country there's a good school where she could learn the best way to carry a child during pregnancy, about childbirth and about raising him once he's born. And what does the father need to do? Valentina Petrovna heard him out attentively and after a short silence said, As you know, Victor Nikovich, I have two children and I've always been interested in the literature about childbirth and raising children, but I've never even heard of there being any such school, whether here in our country or abroad. That's strange. 
They teach people everything, but no one touches on this question. This most important question, not in the schools or in post-secondary schools. Why not? Yes, it's strange, agreed Galatina Petrovna. Somehow I've never given that any thoughts. But now this state of things seems strange to me. It seems that the Duma does discuss the question of teaching about sexual relations, relations in the school, but they don't consider the question of teaching people the right way to bear and raise children. So that means every couple is forced to experiment on their own child. So it seems they have no experiment. Of course, there are all sorts of classes where expectant parents learn what to do during labor and how to interact with a newborn. But since there is no scientific basis for what they teach, it's practically impossible to determine which classes really do help and which do more harm than good. Valentina Petronova answer. What about you, Valentina Petronova? Did you take any of those classes? I decided to have my younger daughter at home in the bathtub with a midwife's help. A lot of people do, the, do that these days. People think it's more comfortable for the child to come into the world at home in the presence of his relatives. They say a newborn can sense when people are acting lovingly toward him and when they're indifferent, as often happens in maternity wards. It's like a conveyor belt there, you know? Victor didn't feel encouraged by his conversation with Val Valentina Petrovna. In fact, it had the opposite effect. It depressed him. For two weeks, he spent all his free time outside of work considering the problem of giving birth to children. For two weeks, whenever he was walking through the city, whenever he went to fancy restaurants, bars, and theaters, he kept looking at women's faces, evaluating them. He even took a trip out to the village but he didn't find anyone suitable for himself there either. One day he drove his jeep with the tented windows over to the teacher's college and looked through the window at the girls walking by. At the three hours of this, he turned his attention to a young woman who'd come out. Unto the porch, a brunette, a brunette with a short but tight braid an elegant figure, and it seemed to him an intelligent face. As she passed by the jeep on her way to the bus stop, Victor lowered the window and called out to her. Young lady, excuse me. I've been waiting for a friend here, and he hasn't shown up. Might you be able to show me the best way to get downtown? And then I could drop you off at home if you'd like? She took in the jeep with a glance and answered calmly. Why ever not? I'll show you. When she gotten into the back seat and they'd introduced themselves, Lucia pointed to Victor's pack of cigarettes and said, Those are good cigarettes. Might I have one? Of course, go ahead. Victor answered and he was happy to hear his cell phone ring. It was nothing important, but as soon as he hung up, Victor made a worried face and informed Lucia, who was greedily taking a drag on the cigarette. Plans have changed. I have to get right to a business meeting. Please forgive me. He let smoking Lucia out of the car. He 
he decided he wouldn't let his son be poisoned by smoke. Victor didn't meet with his lover at all during these two weeks, and he didn't call her. He decided that if she didn't want to have his baby, if all she wanted to do was enjoy herself and hang out at fashionable resorts, then he didn't need her. Of course, it was exceedingly pleasant spending time with her. She was beautiful and smart, but now he made some serious change in his life plans. I'll give her the apartment. After all, this woman has adorned my life for a while. Victor decided he had he headed for that university where Inga studied, planning to give her his set of keys. On his way, he called her on her cell phone. Hi, Inga. Hi, a familiar voice answered. Where are you now? I'm just about to your university. Will you be done soon? I haven't been to school for 10 days and it looks like I won't be going back there in the foreseeable future. Did something happen? Yes. Where are you now? At, at home. When Victor opened the door with his key and walked into the apartment, Inga was lying on the bed in her robe, reading some kind of book. She glanced at Victor. There's coffee and sandwiches in the kitchen, she said, without getting up, and then went back to her reading. Victor made his way to the kitchen, took a couple sips of coffee, had a cigarette, and put his keys on the table, then went to the bedroom door and announced to Inga, who was still reading, I'm leaving maybe for a long time or even forever. I'm leaving you the apartment. Goodbye. Be free. Be happy. And he headed for the exit. Inga caught up with him right by the door. Now hold on, you jerk, she said, although not maliciously, tugging at Victor's sleeve. So you're leaving? You've turned my whole life upside down, and now it's goodbye? How did I turn your life upside down? Victor asked in amazement. I had a good time with you, and I don't think you mind being with me either. Now you have your own apartment and plenty of outfits. Live your life, enjoy yourself the way you want it. Or do you want some money too? You really are a jerk. You really, you really cut me to the quick. An apartment, outfits, enjoy yourself? <laughs> Whatever, don't make a scene. I've got important business. Goodbye. Victor to took hold of the doorknob, but Inga held him back, yet again seizing his hand. No, sweetheart, wait. Please tell me. You asked me to have your baby, didn't you? Yes, I asked you, and you said no. At first I said no, then I spent two days thinking about it, and I agreed. I quit grad school, gave up smoking. I've been exercising every morning, and then I came across these books about life, about children, and I can't put them down. I'm studying the best way to give birth. And he's all goodbye. But you're the one, but you're the only one I can imagine as the father of our. When he realized what he'd heard, Victor impulsively hugged Inga, repeating over and over in a muffled whisper, Inga, Inga, and he picked her up in his arms and carried her into the bedroom, carefully as if she was the greatest treasure, he laid her on the bed and hurried to get undressed. 
more passionately than ever before he embraced Inga as she lay on the bed and began kissing her breasts, her shoulders, while trying to remove her robe. But Inga suddenly offered silent resistance and began pushing him away. Settle down, please. This is not what's important. To make a long story short, we won't be having any sex today or tomorrow or in, or in a month either, Inga informed him. What do you mean no sex? But didn't you just agree to have my baby? Yes, I did. So how are we going to have a baby if we don't have sex? The sex has to be entirely different, fundamentally different. What do you mean? Just what I said. Now tell me, sweetheart, you loving future papa, why do you want your child to come into the world? What do you mean, he asks, sitting down on the bed in disbelief. Everyone knows why, and there's only one way to make it happen. Yes, that makes sense, but humor me here. Let's be clear about what you want and which alternative you're choosing. Do you want your child to be born as a consequence, as a side effect of your, or rather our pleasure of the flesh? Or do you want him to be the fruit of our love, the fruit we consciously wish for? I think a child would find it unpleasant to be a side effect. So you want him to be the fruit of our love. But Victor, you're not in love with me, of course. You like me, but that's not love, not yet. Yes, Inga, I like you very much, you see. And I like you very much too, but that's not love, not yet. We need to earn each other's love. I imagine you've been reading something strange, haven't you, Inga? Love is a feeling that comes up all on its own from who knows where. And it vanishes who knows where. You can earn someone respect, respect, but their love. But that's exactly what we have to do. Earn each other's love and our son will help us do that. Our son? Do you have a feeling we're going to have a son? Why do you say going to? He already exists. What do you mean he exists? Victor said, jumping up. You mean you're already pregnant? Uh, so you were hiding it from me? And whose is he? How far along are you? He's yours and I'm not any time along at all. So he doesn't exist yet. Oh, he exists. Listen, Inga, I don't understand a word you're saying. You're saying some weird things. Can you explain this to me more clearly? I'll try, Sir Victor. You wanted to have a child. And you've been thinking about him. That I wanted to have a child, too. And I've been thinking about him, too. Now, it's a known fact that human thoughts are matter. And that means that if we imagine our child in our thoughts, then he already exists. So, where is he right now? I don't know. Maybe in some other dimensions we don't know about. Maybe he's in some other galaxy in the universe, running barefoot amongst the stars and looking at the blue earth. Well, he'll take material form. Maybe at this very moment, he's choosing where he'll be born and under what conditions. And maybe he wants to let us know that somehow, don't you hear him or feel him axing? Victor looked at Inga wide-eyed as if seeing her for the first time. Never before had she discussed anything this way. He couldn't tell whether she was joking or serious, 
but the phrase may be at this very moment he's choosing he's choosing where he'll be born made him stop and think babies are born in all kinds of places sometimes they're born on a plane or a ship or in a car many are born in mat- maternity wards and some at home in bathtubs they're born where they end up being born but where would ch- children want to be born take him victor if he'd been able to choose where would he have wanted to be born in russia or in the best maternity ward in england say or in america but none of these options particularly appealed to him. Inga interrupted Victor's musings. I have a clear plan of how we need to jointly prepare for our meeting with our son. What kind of plan? Listen carefully, sweetheart. Inga spoke decisively, more decisively than ever, than she ever had before. Now sitting in the easy chair, now walking around the room, The first thing we have to do is to bring our physical condition into perfect order. From now on, we won't smoke or consume alcohol. We'll do a body cleanse beginning with the kidneys and livers, using infusions and fasting. I've already chosen a program. From this moment on, we'll drink only spring water. That's very important. I've already been getting daily deliveries of five little bottles of spring water. True, doing it that way is twice as expensive as going to the store, but that's okay. We can manage it. We need to do a physical workout every day so our muscles will grow stronger and our blood will flow through our veins more forcefully. And we also need fresh air and positive emotions, which are harder to come by. Victor liked Inga's decisiveness, and without even waiting for her to finish laying out her plan, he announced, we'll buy the best workout machines and have the best masseurs come by. I'll send one of my drivers out every day to pick up the spring water and I'll send a different driver out to the forest every day to collect air. He can use a compressor to pump it into tanks under pressure, and then we can let it out in the apartment, little by little. The only thing I don't know is where we can get or buy positive emotion. Maybe we should go to some good resorts, the way people go on honeymoon trips. Yes, definitely like on honeymoons. Tells from the future, a meeting millennia later, from the book by Vladimir McGrath, The New Civilization, Part 2, Rights of Love, translated by Susan Dolning. A girl of about 25 named Liba came to one of the days of the courtship gatherings. Liba was dressed in a single in a simple skirt that fell just below her knees and an embroidered linen top. On her shoulder was a small purse on a strap. Libya didn't have many outfits. The girl was walking along the street in hopes of finding some kind of lodging on a private house. During the courtship gatherings, all the rooms, all the rooms and hotels and boarding houses had already been reserved beforehand. In any case, the girl didn't have the money to pay for an expensive hotel room, which is why she was looking for simpler lodging. But it wasn't easy to find private lodging while the, while the courtship gatherings were going on. Not particularly hopeful, Libya addressed a woman who was coming out of the gate of a private house. Hello, could you tell, 
could you tell me please whether you might have room in your house where I could stay for the night, preferably on the less expensive side? The woman answered, there's no point in looking, my dear. Everything's been for for a long time. Everyone who comes arranges their lodging beforehand with an apartment agency. Don't waste your time. Go to the train station. Although you won't even find a place to sit down there either. Thank you for the advice. That's what I'll do most likely, Lydia replied, and set off along the street in the direction of the train station. Hold on, dear, come here. The woman called on out to her, and Lydia went back over to her. Here's something you can do. Try knocking or ringing at that house, the one four doors down from me. There's a doorbell on the gate there. Push that button. Maybe the old granny will come out. She looks like Baba Yaga. She's a Greek with a hook nose. <laughs> My husband said that all young Greek girls are beautiful, but the old ones are like witches. So dear, go ahead and ask her to put you up. Back when her man was still alive, she used to take a lot of people in, but he died. And since then, this is the third year she hasn't taken a single person. But you give it a try. Ask her. She might just take you in. Thank you. I'll, I'll try that, said Lydia. And she walked up to the house the woman had indicated. indicated. She pressed the button once. And after a minute, she pushed a button on the gate again, but no one came out. Ten minutes passed. The door creaked, and a hunchback old woman came out of the house, groan, groaning. She made her way toward the gate along the path that was overgrowing with grapevines. She opened the gate and began thinking without even saying hello. What are you breaking down my gate for, girl? She asks discontently. I'd like to ask you to put me up. A kind woman, your neighbor, suggested it. She's not kind. She was having a laugh at you. I haven't taken anyone for a long time now. I know that. She told me that too, but I've been looking for lodging for the whole day without finding anything. And so I made up my mind to turn to you and see whether I might get lucky. <laughs> you decided to see whether you might get lucky. You won't get any luck from me. You've all come here to get lucky. Did you show up to look for a, a fiancé for yourself too? I want to meet my intended here. Please forgive me for bothering you. I'll head off to the train station now and spend the night there. It began spitting rain and the old woman muttered, They're the ban for my existence, this girls. They're the ban for my existence, this girls. The ban and it's begun to rain. All right, I'll set you up in the garden under the awning. There's a hammock there and a bench and some nails you can hang your clothes on and you'll pay me 500 rubles a night. Libya was shocked. 500? And how much did you think I charge? Would you think to come to visit your relatives? I agree to 500. It's just that I, I was hoping to spend about 10 days here. But it doesn't matter. I'll stay five. I agree to your conditions, grandmother. Then let's go to where you'll be sleeping. You'll have 
a look at it and you'll pay me for each day in advance. Five days pass and in the morning, Libya began packing her unsophisticated little things into her bag. The old woman came up to her groaning and leaning on a stick. You're all set to go, dear? You're off? Yes, grandmother, the five days have already passed. Yes, they've passed. Do you already have your ticket? The old woman asked and sat down on the bench. Yes, I bought a round trip ticket. It's for five days from now, but maybe I'll be able to exchange it for today or tomorrow. You won't be able to exchange it. Such great gudgeons of, uh, gudgeons of folks have descended here. Here's what you do, dear. Stay another five days with me until the date on your ticket. I can't stay. I have nothing to pay you with. If you have nothing to pay me with, well, then don't pay. Just stay. Thank you, grandmother. Thank you, she says to me. Only nothing will come of your staying. Why not? I've been watching you. That's not the way people look for fiancés these days. Why do you get up with the sun? What for? All the fiancés are still asleep at dawn, and you go to bed early. That's just the time the evening parties are getting going, and you're getting ready for bed. All the fiancés are out and about till midnight. You're already asleep by ten. You dress like a nun. And you don't wear any makeup at all. That's not how people look for fiancés these days. My body, grandmother. I'm preparing my body for my meeting with my intended. That's what I try to keep my regime. I don't wear makeup so that he'll be able to recognize me. <laughs> recognize you, dear? Recognize you, you dear? Or cookie in the head. Cookie in the head. My mama tells me the same thing, but I can't do a thing with myself. I often have dreams where he's searching the whole world for me and just he can't find me. Dreams, you have dreams. And have you had them here too? Yes, twice already. One time it was as if I was strolling around a big garden and he was also there, but we just couldn't manage to get to each other. And it was as if I was hearing his voice. He kept calling me. Where are you? Where are you? You heard it? His voice? You should probably go see a doctor, dear. What do you have to drum it into your head for you about an intender? So you even hear voices in your sleep. Sometime I have a dream where it seems that he had, he and I lived together sometime long, long ago. And we had children and grandchildren. You lived together, had children. Now, dear, can you describe what he looks like to? Yes, I can. He's half a head taller than I. Brown haired and brown eyes. A kind smile, a small gap between his front teeth. A dignified gait. A gait in his gait? But what if you meet someone different? I've met some before at home. Mama yells at me every time. Says my dreams are keeping me a virgin. <laughs> keeping you a virgin? Of course they are. With dreams like that, you'll never find a fiancé. Never meet one. You know, dear, here's what I'm going to tell you. Tonight, take my flower shawl. F threw it around its shoulders and tie it in, in a kind of stylish way and take a stroll along the shore later in the evening. Thank you for your concern, Grandma, but I can't throw a, sh uh, a shawl over my blouse. I embroidered the design in my blouse myself. It came to me in a dream and if as if some time long ago, I stroll in the garden with my intended, wearing a blouse with that design. 
Well, that design you stroll well, dear. I don't know. Maybe God be your judge. There comes melt by the house on a table. And I bake a flat cake. Have something to eat. I'm going to go to see the neighbors. The old woman headed off, groaning. She mumbled under her breath. I bought it all down on my gray head myself. Well, I'm a fool. I let her in and I have to look after her. I'll go and convince the neighbor's son to court her. Yes, let him court her. Only he's got black hair and she needs a brown hair, one with a gap. And the neighbors don't have one like that. Starting in the morning, Libya wandered around the square. For lunch, she bought a little pastry filled with potato. As she was walking past the restaurant, a group of men was coming out. They were laughing and merrily talking back and forth in some foreign language. When they saw Libya, they started speaking to her in their language. But Libya couldn't understand the foreign speech and walk on past. The man immediately began talking with some other girls. And suddenly, without even looking back, she felt that someone had left the group of merry foreigners and was walking after her. She knew for certain that he was walking after her and no one else. She even counted his step without walking faster herself. And for some reason, her heart was fluttering. She could sense his breath behind her. And suddenly the man walking behind her said, in a language she didn't understand, With you, O beautiful goddess, I could create a space of love for all eternity. Translation from German. Libya couldn't translate the words from the German, but for some reason she whispered, I'm prepared to help you in the great co-creation and turn to face the foreigner. Before her stood a young man, half a head taller than she, with brown hair and brown eyes, with a kind smile and a small gap between his front teeth. He extended his hand to Libya, and Libya, numb, not knowing what was happening, leaned against his chest. He embraced her trembling body as if he had known it forever. The planets invisible high above them shook with the light. Oh, how many events have they had to create? How many threads of fate had they had to carry throughout the centuries? But it had worked. They had met and embraced. Radomir and the beautiful Lubomila. And it didn't matter if they didn't remember the past. Their souls, their souls would create a beautiful future. People on the beach were perplexed. Why were that young man and that girl creating some kind of sketch or drawing on that sand? They were speaking different languages, but they seemed to understand each other. Now they discussed what they're drawn. Now argue a bit or suddenly lightly agree with each other about this or that and caught up in their drawing. Lamilia and Radomir also didn't know that they were drawing on the sand the very plan for a marvelous homestead that they had created 5,000 years earlier before their wedding. The pond should be here and it should be round, Radomir announced in his language, digging out a little small hole in the sand. That's not at all the way it should be, Lamilia smiled. The pond should be oval. And she corrected the circle, making it an oval. Yes, exactly, Rodemir agreed, as if recalling something. An oval pond is better somehow. And in the evening, they went to the house where Lubmiel was, was staying. 
She asks her granny land landlady permission for her companion to spend some time with her before she went to sleep. The landlady gave her permission. Lobomir fell asleep in the hammock, smiling. He sat on the bench, rocking the hammock ever so slightly and taking great care to drive away the various gnats with a branch. And he was singing something ever so softly. And the old woman pulled the curtain outside the tiniest bit and watched him from the window of the house until the early morning light. In the morning, a pitcher of milk and flat breads covered with a white cloth stood on the table in front of the house. There was also a note written in an elderly hand. Amelia read it. I'm off on some errands. I'll be gone for two days. Guard the house and so as to guard it, live in the big room. There's food in the refrigerator. Libomelia and Radomir left together. But where did they head? The centuries will show us where the family line will rise up. Tells from the Future Horsewoman from the Future from the book by Vladimir McGrath Who Are We? Translated by Marion Schwartz I saw a wagon from a settlement or rather a carriage with its top down harnessed to a chestnut horse. An elderly woman sat on the carriage, soft seat, a basket of apples and vegetables in front of her. Up front, a shirtless boy of about seven held the reins, but he wasn't guiding the horse. This was probably not the first time they had made their trip, and the horse was trotting down a familiar route. The boy turned to the elderly woman and said something to her. The grandmother smiled and began to sing. The child joined in, picking up the refrain. Tourists passing in electric buses could scarcely have heard their song. The horse was running down the road about a kilometer from the highway. Nearly all the tourists look at the people in the carriage through binoculars, holding their breath as if it were a miracle or extraterrestrials, and once again, I thought that what that this wasn't working out quite right, quite right. People were coming from distant countries, but could not interact normally with those whom they had come to see. They could only observe from afar. And the two in the carriage weren't even looking in their direction. One of the buses slowed down and proceeded in parallel with the speed of the trotting horse. Sitting in this bus was a group of foreign children. They wave at the grandmother and grandson, riding in the distance in their handsome carriage, or rather to the boy, but he did not even glance in their direction once. Suddenly a young horsewoman appeared from the handsome flat field living gates of the settlement. Her fast bay began catching up to the carriage at a swift gallop. Pulling even, the heated horse began prancing alongside. The elderly woman smiled and listened to what the young horseman was telling her. The boy dissatisfied, probably with the interruption and the singing, but still with hidden joy said, didactically. What a fidget you are, Mama. You can't stay alone for a minute. The young woman laughed, took a turnover out of the canvas sack tied to her saddle and held it out to the boy. He took it, bit it in, into it, and then, with the words, Try it, Grandma. It's still nice and warm. Held the turnover out to the elderly woman and pulling on the reins. Stopped the carriage. The boy leaned over, 
take the basket, fill with handsome apples. Up with two hands, held it out to the rider and said, Please, Mama, take this to them. And his eyes pointed toward the, the halted bus of foreign children. Lightly grabbing the heavy basket of apples with one hand and giving her prancing steed a light slap on the neck, the young horsewoman dashed toward the bus of children. By that time, several more buses had, buses had stopped next to the children, and their passengers were ecstatically watching the rider race across the meadow holding a basket of apples. She flew up to the children who had spilled out of the bus, rein in her horse, deftly bent down, and without getting out of the saddle, placed a basket of apples before the ecstatic children. She also managed to put a swarthy little boy on, on the head, wave and greeting to all, and head her steed right down the middle of the highway. The bus driver announced over his portable radio, she's racing right down the median strip. She's beautiful. Many tourist buses pull off onto the highway shoulder and stop. The people quickly got out of the bus and line up along the road, holding their breath. They watched a young beauty riding at a swift gallop. Not an exclamation, but a whisper, admi ad but a whisper of admiration tore from many lips, and there was something to admire. Her hot steed racing in a swift gallop threw up sparks from its hoovers. No one was chasing it. The woman riding it did not have a whip or even a twig, but the steed kept picking up its swift pace. Its hooves barely touched the road and its mane fanned out in the oncoming wind. It must have wanted to be worthy of the beauty riding it. Her outward beauty was unusual, of course, one could admire, but her regular facial features and her dark blonde braid and her thick eyelashes, of course, under her embroidered white blouse and skirt and white daisies, one could clearly imagine the taut, chiseled torso of her magnificent figure. The flowing feminine lines of her entire figure seemed to frame an indefatigable energy. The flush playing on her cheeks radiated the grandeur and indomitable possibilities of this mysterious energy. The young looking rider stood out from the people standing at the side of the road with her unusual healthy look. She sat on her hot steed without the slightest tension. She was not even holding onto the palm or rain, palm over reins, and she had not put her feet, which were thrown to one side of the horse rump, into the stirrups. Lowering her eyelashes, she rebraided her hair, which had come slightly undone into a tight braid with smooth movements of her hand. Sometimes the beauty raised her eyelashes, and when her gaze seems to sink <clears throat> with an invisible, pleasant fire, one of the people in the crowd, the person who met the, that gaze, seemed to straighten up visibly, became taller. People seemed to catch with their feelings the light and energy emanating from the rider and attempt to fill up with it, at least partially. She understood their desire, graciously shared, and she raced forward and she was beautiful. Suddenly, a temperamental Italian ran out on the road to intercept the, the speeding horse, spread his arms out and exclaimed ecstatically, Voshea a lufio voshea. The rider neither shuddered nor took fright. When her horse reared and pranced in place, she just grabbed the pommel of her saddle with one hand. With the other, tore a flower from the wreath adorning her head and threw it to the Italian. He caught the gift, pressed it carefully to his chest as if it were the greatest treasure, constantly repeating, Mamma mia, mamma mia.
but the beauty wasn't looking at the ardent Italian. She touched the reins of her stead, and the horse moved, dancing lightly toward the people, standing on the shoulder. The crowd parted, and the young light rider lightly jumped from her horse and stood opposite a woman who looked like European and was carrying a little girl. The little girl was asleep. The slightly round shoulder mother with a pale face and tired eyes was having a hard time holding her, trying not to disturb the child asleep. The rider stopped opposite the woman and smiled at her. The two women, the two mothers' eyes met. You could tell how different the two women and her states were. The despondency of the mother holding her child made her resemble a fading flower next to the young woman who had approached her and whose appearance was associated with the infatigable exuberance of the flowering of thousands of gardens. The two women looked into each other's eyes silently and suddenly as it as if aroused by some new awareness, the mother holding the sleeping girl stood up straight and a smile appeared on her face, with smooth, unusual, graceful, feminine movements of her hands. The Russian removed the pretty wreath from her head and put it on the mother's head. They did not say a single word to each other. Lightly jumping into the saddle of the horse, standing calmly nearby, the beautiful rider once again rushed forward. For some reason, the people applauded her and the now smiling slender woman, holding her now awakened, smiling little daughter, watch her go. And the ardent Italian tearing off an expensive wristwatch ran after her and shouted, a souvenir, Mamma Mia, but the beauty was already far away. Her dashing horse turned off the road onto a platform where tourists were sitting at long tables, drinking cavas and fruit drink, and trying some other dishes as well, which waiters served to them from a handsome carved wooden house. Yet another building was being completed nearby. Two men were laying a handsome card frame around the window of the new building, which was probably a store or restaurant. Hearing the clicking of hooves, one of the men turned toward the approaching rider, said something to his comrade, and leaped from the scaffolding. The ardent beauty reigned in her horse jumped to the ground, quickly untied a canvas bag from her saddle, ran toward the man, and shyly held out the bag to him. Turnovers, apple turnovers, like you like, still warm. You are such a fidgeter. Ekaturka, the man said gently. Eating a turnover out of the bag, and screwing his face up from pleasure. The tourists sitting at the table stopped eating and drinking to admire the lovers. That is how this man and this young beauty, who had just jumped from her hot stead, steed stood in front of each other, as if they weren't man and wife at all, as if they did not have children, but were ardent lovers. The beauty who had just galloped 15 kilometers under the admiring gaze of the tourists and who had seemed omnipotent and as free as the wind stood shyly in front of her beloved, looked up at him and then lowered her lashes shyly. The man suddenly stopped eating and smiled. Ekotanaka, look. There's a wet spot on your blouse. That means it's time to feed the Mishka. She covered <clears throat> the small wet spot on her milk-filled breast with her hand and replied shyly, I'll be there in time. 
he is still asleep. I'll do everything in time. Then hurry. I'll be home soon too. We're already finishing out work. Look, do you like it? She glanced at the windows decorated with card frames. Yes, I like it very much. I also wanted to tell you something. Speak. She came right up to her husband and stood on tiptoe, stretching up to his ear. He leaned over, listening closely, and she quickly kissed his cheek and without turning around, hopped in the saddle of a horse standing next to her. The beauty's happy, cascading laughter merged with the clicking of hooves. She sped, she sped home, not down the asphalt road, but across the meadow grass. All the tourists were still watching her go. And what was so special about this young woman galloping across the meadow on her dashing steed? This mother of two children, yes, she was beautiful. Yes, she brimmed over with energy. Yes, she was good. But why do all the people watch her go so unwaveringly? Might this not be simply a woman speeding across a meadow on a horse? Might this be materialized happiness rushing home to feed her infant and greet her, greet her beloved husband? The people are admiring happiness racing home. Ivan Niklov Niklovich went on to send an encoded message, message to headquarters. The next morning, there was an emergency session of Russian military council. Protection was organized around the settlement where Ivan Nikolovich homestead was located. The guards tried to be discreet and the soldiers wore road, wore road worker uniforms. Five kilometers from the settlement, on its outskirts, they allegedly began building a, a ring road building. At every meter, simultaneously, simultaneously, day and night, television cameras were installed at Ivan Nikolovich homestead to follow every minute of little Dasha's life. The picture was transmitted to a center resembling a space flight mission control center. Tens of specialists, psychologists, and military personnel prepared to give the necessary instructions in the event of an emergency, kept continuous vigil at the monitors. Specialists, psychologists, with the help of a special link were constantly giving Widow Dasha's parent recommendation about how to distract her with something to keep her from falling into contemplation again. The Russian government made an international statement that seemed odd to many, which said that there were forces in Russia capable of exploding any type of armament, no matter where they were. These forces were not wholly under the control of the Russian government, but talks were being held with them. The unlikelihood of the statement demanded confirmation. An international council decided to manufacture a series of unusual shaped projectiles. They were manufactured with square cartridge cases. Each of the countries participating in the experiment took 20 of these projectiles and hid them in different places on their territory. But why do they make the product projectiles with square cartridge cases? Why couldn't they use ordinary ones? I asked Anastasia. Vladimir, they were afraid that not only all existing projectiles in the world might blow up, but also the bullets in the magazines of police and military guns, everyone carrying a weapon with ammunition. Yes, of course. And how did the ex how and how did the experiment with square projectiles go? Ivan Nikolovich called his little daughter Dasha into his study, showed her the photograph of the square projectile, and asked her to blow them up. Dasha looked at the photograph and said, "I love you very much, Papa dear, but I can't carry out your request." Why? Ivan Nikolovich was amazed. 
because it won't work. Why won't it, Dashnika? It did before. You blew up a whole series of modern missiles, but now it won't. I was so upset then, Papa dear. I didn't want you to go away and sit so many hours at your computer. When you sit at your computer, you don't talk to anyone and don't do anything interesting. But now you're always nearby. You become very good, dear Papa, so I can't make anything explode. Ivan Nikolovich realized that Dasha was incapable of blowing up the square projectiles because the goal of blowing them up, the point wasn't clear to her. Ivan Nikolovich paced agitatedly around his study, thinking feverishly about how to find a solution. He began heatedly trying to convince Dasha. He talked to his daughter as if he were reasoning with himself. It won't work. Yes, that's too bad. There have been wars in the world, world for millennia. Wars ended between some. And others started to fight. Millions of people died and are dying now. Huge amounts of monies are spent on weapons. There was an opportunity to put a stop to this endless destructive process. But unfortunately, Ivan Nikolovich looked at Dasha sitting in the chair. His daughter's face was calm. She watched with interest as he paced around his study and spoke. But the meaning of the words uttered did not upset Dasha. She did not completely realize what what war was, what kind of money he was talking about, and who was spending it. She was thinking her own thoughts. Why is Papa pacing around his study, so upset among the unkind computers, which don't give out any energy? Why doesn't he want to go out into the orchard where the trees are blooming and the birds are singing, where every blade of grass and every twig on the tree caresses your whole body with something invisible? Mama and my brother Kosya are there now. I hope Papa stopped this boring talk so we can go out into the orchard together. When Mama and Kosya see them, they'll be so happy. Mama would smile, and yesterday Kosa promised to tell me how to. And yesterday Kosa promised to tell me how you can touch a distant star by touching a pebble or a flower. Kosa always keeps his promises. Dashenka, am I boring you? Do you not understand what I've said? Ivan Nikolovich addressed his daughter. Are you thinking your own thoughts? Papa dear, I'm thinking. Why are you and I here and not in the orchard where everything is waiting for us? Ivan Nikolovich realized he needs to speak more sincerely and, and specifically with his daughter. So he began. The Shenka, when you blew up the missile by looking at their picture... The idea was born to verify your abilities one more time, or rather to show the whole world Russia's ability to destroy all the armaments in the world. Then there would be no point producing them, no point in danger, in dangers. People themselves would destroy those already made. Universal disarmament would begin. The square projectors were manufactured manufactured specially so that you could demonstrate your abilities without anyone dying in the process. Blow them up, Dashenka. I can't do that now, Papa dear. Why you could why you could before and now you can't? I promise myself never to blow anything up again. And since I promise I don't have the ability to blow anything up now. You don't? But why did you promise yourself? Brother Coaster showed me pictures in his book of how people's bodies fly to pieces from explosion. How people are scared of explosions. How trees fall and die from explosions. So I promised myself. 
Shinka, does that mean you can never do it now? Even just one more time? Just one? These square project tells here. Ivan Nikolovich held out a photograph of the square projectile to his daughter. They were manufactured especially and hidden in secluded places in different countries. There aren't any people next to them or even nearby. Everyone is waiting to see whether or not they'll blow up. Blow them up, daughter. This will not be breaking your promise. No one will perish on the contrary. Dasha look at the photograph of the square projectile again, indifferently, and reply calmly. If I take back my promise, those projectiles still won't blow up, Papa dear. But why? Because you talk too much, Papa dear. And when I look at the photograph, I immediately dislike the square goblins. They're ugly and now. What now, Dashenko? What? Forgive me, please, Papa dear, but you talk so much after you showed them to me that since then, they've been almost entirely eating up. Eating up? What's been eating up? The square projectiles, projectiles are nearly eaten up. As soon as I didn't like the projectiles, I could tell. They'd been set in motion and started eating them up very, very fast. Who are they? Oh, the little ones. They're around us everywhere and inside us. They're good, Costa says. They're bacterial or microorganism, but I'd rather call them my nice little ones. They like that more. Sometimes I play with them. People pay almost no attention to them, but they always try to do something good for each person. When a person rejoices, the joyous energy makes him feel good. When a person is angry or breaks something living, they perish in great numbers. Others rush to take the place of those who have perished. Sometimes others do not manage to replace the dead and the human body falls ill. But you are here, Dashenka, and the missiles are hidden far away underground in different countries. How could they well these little ones learn of your desires so quickly in other countries. Oh, they tell each other everything in a chain. A lot faster. The electrons run in your computer. My computer, communication, just a second. I'm going to verify everything. Video cameras have been installed around every missile in our territory. I'll be just a second. Ivan Nikolovich turned toward his communication computer. The image of a square projectile glowed on the monitor, or rather, what was left of the projectile. The cartridge case was rusty and full of holes, and the warhead was lying nearby and significantly smaller. Ivan Nikolovich switched screens, but the same thing had happened to the other projectiles. The image of a man in military uniform appeared on the screen. Hello, Ivan Nikolovich. You yourself have already seen everything. What conclusion has the council drawn? Ivan Nikolovich asks. The council members, members have divided up into groups and are consulting security. Security is trying to work out additional safety measures for the site. Don't call my daughter's site. Don't call my daughter a sight. You're nervous, Ivan Neklovich, and in this situation, that is Im impermissible. In 10 minutes, an expert group consisting of leading specialists, psychologists, biologists, and radio electronics specialists will be joining you. They are already en route. They're, they are already en route. Set up the communication with your daughter. Prepare her. What opinions are most of the council members inclining toward? For now, toward your family's total isolation within the bonds of your homestead. You must immediately clear out all images of technical devices. Remain by your daughter's side and try to keep a constant watch on her. The group of specialists from the military council who arrive at Ivan Oklovich homestead spoke with little Dasha. 
for an hour and a half. The child patiently answered the adult's question, but after an hour and a half, something happened that completely confused all the specialists present at the homestead and all those observing what was, what was happening from the Security Council Center on our huge monitors. After an hour and a half of talking with little Dasha, the door of Ikan Ivan Nakovich's expensive study opened. Dasha's brother, Kosha, walked into the study. He was carrying the kukuku clock, which was cuckooing continuously. Kosia put the clock on the desk. The clock hands were at 11. And when the mechanical cuckoo was supposed to finish the specific number of cuckoos, the big hand of the clock quickly circled the clock face and the cuckoo started over from the beginning. And silence those present look at the clock's bizarre movement. And then Dasha baffled. I, Dasha suddenly explained, I completely forgot. I have to go take care of something important. It's my friend Venuka who's spinning the hands. That's what we agreed. If I forget, I have to go. Two guards blocked the exit from the study. What will you forget, Dashenka? Ivan Niklovich asked his daughter. I forgot to go to the homestead where my friend Renishka lives and struck a little flower and water it. Other eye, it's sad without caressing. It's like it likes to be looked at tenderly. But the flower isn't yours after all. Ivan Niklovich commented to his daughter. Why can't your friend stroke it yourself? It herself, her own flower. Papa dear Varunuka and her friend and her parents went on a visit. A visit where? Somewhere in Siberia. Exclamation by those present uttered nearly in a whisper were heard on all slides. She's not the only one. What ability does your friends have? Your friend have? She's not the only one. How many are there? How can they how can they be determined? We must take immediate measures for each stop for for each such child. All the exclamation subsides as soon as an elderly graying man sitting in the edge rose from his seat. This man was senior in rank and position, not only among the people present in Ivan Nevlukish study, he was chairman of the Russian Security Council. Everyone turned toward him and fell silent. The gray haired man looked at Dasha, sitting in her little wooden armchair, and a tiny tear rolled down his cheek. And the gray-haired man slowly walked up to Dasha, dropped to one knees before her, and reached out to her. Dasha stood up, took a step, and picking up the hem of her skirt, dropped her curtsy and put her little hand in his palm. The gray-haired man looked at her for a while, then bowed his head and respectfully kissing Dasha's hand, said, Forgive us, please, little goddess. My name is Dasha, the little girl replied. Yes, of course your name is Dasha. Tell us, what must be on our earth? The little girl looked with surprise into the elderly man's face, drew close to him, cautiously wiped the little tear from his face with her palm, and touched his mustache with her finger. Then she turned toward her brother. Kosa, you promised to help me be with the lilies in Veronica's ponds. Do you remember your promise? Yes, Kosa answered. Then let's go, let's go. Dasha stopped at the doorway after passing the guards who had parted before her, turned to the man still kneeling on one knee, smiled at him and said confidently, what must be on earth is goodness. Six hours later, speaking at an extended session of the Russian Security Council, the gray hair chairman said, Everything in the world is relative, relative to our generation. The new one is akin to God's. 
we must come even with it, not it with us. All the military might, might of the planet with its unique technical achievements prove powerless before this one little girl of the new generation. Our task, our duty, and our obligation before this new generation is to clear away the trash. We must apply all our efforts toward clearing the earth of all weaponry, our technical achievements and the discoveries embodied in the most modern and as we thought unique military complexes turn out to be unnecessary junk in the face of the new generation and we have to clear it away. Disarmament race. An international conference was held for the Security Council of the military blocs of the different countries and continents. Their plans were worked out for the emergency recycling of military equipment and ammunition. Scientists from different countries exchanged their experience in recycling technologies. Psychology spoke constantly in the media trying to avert a panic among the populace which own various types of firearms. Panic arose after news of the Russian phenomenon was leaked to the media. The facts were somewhat distorted. Several Western news sources spoke about how Russia was recycling their ammunition on its territory on an emergency basis and was preparing at X hour to blow up the military reserves of other countries, destroying in the process the majority of the population. People started throwing the firearms and ammunitions they had into the rivers and burying them in wastelands because official recycling depots could not accept them from those who wanted to turn them in. Fines were set for unauthorized recycling. Middlemen firms took large payment for accepting each cartridge. But this did not stop those who wanted who wanted to form who wanted to from getting rid of what presented a threat to the lives of entire families. The people of cities located close to military bases demanded that the authorities immediately immediately eliminate military sites. But the defense industry which had been refocused to recycle what it had previously produced was working at the limit of its capacity as it was. The press of many Western countries began to spread more and more rumors about how Russia was threatening the world with disaster. The world could not get rid of its accumulated weapons and many enterprises recycling military arms and ammunition were working at the limit of their capacity. They could not destroy the weapons produced over a decade in just a few months. The Russian government was accused of allegedly knowing for a long time about these unusual children and of preparing well beforehand to recycle lethal weapons. To confirm these rumors, the fact was cited that the Russian government had engaged in buying up and dissembling ecologically unreliable enterprises, not only in its own country, but those in countries close to Russia's borders. If Russia was the first to clear its territory of explosive weapons, it would have the opportunity to destroy countries lagging in the disarmament race. They intentionally exaggerate all the possible devastation and consequences of a world ca catastrophe. Firms that recycle ammunition found this very profit profitable since the price for their service rose. For example, someone turning a gun cartridge for recycling had to pay $20 per cartridge. Unauthorized burial or disposal of a weapon was viewed as an act of sabotage. Panic was also mounting because no one could propose effective protection from the powers discovered in Russian children. The Russian presided 
the, the, the Russian president agreed to what everyone then thought to be a desperate and ill-considered step. He decided to appear live on air over all channels of world television, surrounded by children with unusual abilities. When the day and time of the Russian president's live appearance was announced, nearly the entire population of the planet gathered by their television screens. Just ahead of this hour, many enterprises stopped work. Stores closes and the streets were deserted. People awaited the news from Russia. The Russian president wanted to, wanted to use his appearance to reassure people and to show the whole world that the generation of the Russian being born were not bloodthirsty monsters, monsters, but good ordinary children, and there was no need to fear them. In order to be more convincing, the Russian president asked his assistants to assemble in his office about 30 children with unusual abilities and decided to remain alone in the office with those children. Everything was done in just this way. What did the Russian president tell the world community? If, we, if you would like, if you like, you can see this, the scene for yourself and hear what was said. Vladimir. Yes, I would like that. Watch. Russia's president stood at a small podium next to his desk. Children of different ages from about three to ten sat on little chairs on either side of the podium. Near the opposite wall of the office were journalists with television cameras. The president began to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, Fellow citizen, I have invited you especially to meet the children, as you yourself will be convinced. I am in this office with them alone, without a guard, psychologist, or parents. These children are not the monsters many media in the West have attempted to portray. You yourself can see that these are ordinary children. Their faces and actions show no signs of aggressiveness. We consider some of their abilities unusual. But is that in fact the case? The abilities that have begun to be discovered in the new generating generation may be ordinary for the human, human individual, individual. What may be unusual and unacceptable for human existence are our creations. The human's community has created a system of communication and military potential capable of leading our planets to cat catastrophe. Over the centuries, peace talks have been held between the states with the greatest military power, but the arms race has not stopped. Today, there is a real opportunity to put an end to this endless destructive process. Right now, those countries where lethal weapons are not concentrated are in the most advantaged position. For us, this position appears unnatural. But let's think hard about why we so deeply believe that the production of lethal weaponry threatened the entire nation with man's annihilation is natural. The new generation has changed its priorities and forced us to move in the opposite direction, to disarm the fear, panic, and fevered actions that are accompanying this process has been created largely thanks to the distortions of the news. The Russian government has been accused of long knowing about the appearance in its country of children with unusual abilities. These, these accusations are groundless. Russia still has a lot of military potential. And like many countries, we are doing everything possible to recycle it. The Russian government has been accused of not trying to discover all the children with unusual abilities and not taking action to isolate them, which implies forcible hypnotism until the disarmament process is, is complete. The, gov the Russian government will not agree to this step. Russian children are full-fledged citizen of our country. 
Let us think about this desire to isolate those who do not accept the weapons of murder rather than those who produce them. The Russian government is taking measures to avert an accidental emotional outburst among children capable of sending an impulse and blowing up a type of weapon they dislike. Films displaying killing weapons have been completely banned from Russian television channels. Toys that imitate weapons have been destroyed. Their parents are by their parents' side, constantly in, and try to ward off the negative reaction. The president broke off his speech. A tow-headed boy of five or so stood up and walked toward a, trip, a, trip pod, a trip pod supporting a video camera. First, he simply examined the tripod screws, and when he grabbed them, the operator ab abandoned his camera and retreated behind the generous back and flight, backs in flight. The president quickly walked up to the boy who had frightened the cameraman, took his hand and led him to the chair where he had been sitting quietly before, murmuring as they went, please sit quietly until I finish. But he was unable to continue his speech. Two children of three or four were doing something with the communication equipment near the desk. The children who had been sitting quietly since the beginning of the speech scattered through the office and did different things. Only the older children and there were very few of them sat in their places, examining the journalists and television cameras. Among them was a girl with ribbons and her hair, and I recognized her, Dasha, who had blown up modern missile complexes. Assessing what was going on in a very unchildishly intelligent and careful way was observing the journalist's reaction. People glued to, to, to their television screens all over the world, world saw the Russian president's slightly distraught face. He looked at the children scattered up through his office. He saw two children, children doing something with the government cameras and looked at the door outside of which his assistants and the invited children parents were but did not call to anyone for help. The president apologized for his interrupt speech quickly walk up to two children who were dragging one of the devices of his, um, of, off his desk, pick them up under their arms and said, these are not your toys. One of the boys who found himself behind, held up by the president, saw his pal hanging from the president other side and laughed out gay gaily. The second child squirming tugged on the president tie and said, they are. That's what you think, but they aren't. They're toys, the, small child, the smiling child repeatedly merely. The president saw a few more children attracted by the blinking color lights and sound walk up and start touching the telephone receivers. Then he put the two fidgers down on the floor, walked quickly to his desk, pressed a button and said, immediately turn off all communication in my office. Then he quickly spread out blank pieces of paper on his desk. He put a pencil out pen, he put a pencil or pen on each and said, turning to the kids crowding around him, here you go, you can draw whatever you want draw and then we'll all look and see who's turn out the best. The children surrounded the desk to take paper and pencils or pens. The shorter ones couldn't reach the desk, so the president began pulling up chairs and sitting or standing the little ones on the chair. Chairs. Convinced that he had distracted the children with drawing, the president once again walked up to his podium, smiled at the television views, gathered air into his lungs intending to continue his speech and couldn't. A little boy walked up to him and started tugging at his trouser. What's this? What do you need? P, the child said. What? P, P. You mean you need to go to the bathroom? And the president looked at the office door again. The door opened 
and two of the president's assistants to guard quickly rushed to him. One of the men with a stern and somewhat tense face leaned over and took the child by the hand, but the child, not letting go of the president's trouser leg, squirmed away, jerked his hand out of that of the stern man pulling him out of the office, and made a gesture of protest toward the other man approaching. The men who had come in were at a loss. The child raised his little face again and looking up at the president, tugged at his trousers again and said, pee, and he squatted a little. You picked a bad time with your pee <clears throat> and you lost a very hard to please. The president said quickly, picking the child up in his arms and apologizing to the journalist and headed to the door saying as he went, we'll be quick and he, and he walked out. On the screens of hundreds of millions of television, the television cameras showed the children playing, drawing, and take, talking to each other. Most often they showed the president podium where no one stood. And then little Dasha rose from her seat. She took her, she took her chair, dragged it to the president, to the presidential podium, climb on the chair, look at the journalists, and then to the camera's lens, aim at her, straighten the bow, bows on her braids, the, straighten the bows on her braids, and begin to speak. My name is Dasha. Our president is a nice man. He'll be right back. He'll be back and he'll tell you everything. He's a little nervous, but he'll be able to tell everyone how good it's going to be everywhere on earth and that no one should be afraid of us. My brother Kostya told me that people are afraid of us children now because I blew up the big new, the big new missiles. But I didn't just want to blow them up. I wanted to keep my papa from leaving us for long times and for my papa not to think so much about these missiles and not to look at them. He should look at mama. She's better than all the missiles. She's so happy when Papa looks at her and talks to her. But when he goes away for a long time or looks at missiles, Mama is sad. And I don't want my Mama to be sad. Kosia, my brother, is very smart and sensible. And Kosia says I've scared lots of people. I won't blow anything up anymore. That's not interesting at all. There are other things to do that are very important and interesting. They will bring you joy. To, they will bring joy to everyone. And you will take part the missiles yourself so that no one can ever blow them up. Please don't be afraid of us. Come visit us, all of you. We'll give you all life-giving waters to drink. My mama told me how people here used to live. They were about their business and built different factories and plants and got so carried away that all of a sudden there was a there was no life-giving water left. The water got dirty and they only sold water in bottles in stores. But the water in bottles is dead, suffocated, and people started getting sick. That was how it used to be, but I just couldn't imagine how people could pollute the water they themselves were drinking. But my papa said that even now on earth, there were whole countries where there was any living. Clean water and people in those countries were dying from agonizing disease. There aren't any apples in those countries or delicious berries because everything living is sick. And a person who eats something sick suffers. You should come visit, visit us all. Come visit and we'll treat you to apples that aren't sick and tomatoes and pears and berries. You try them and when you go home, you tell yourself, we shouldn't pollute. It's better to live in clean, cleanliness. And when you have everything clean, we'll come visit you with present. 
The president who had returned, carrying the little boy, was standing in the door and listened to Dasha speak. And when she fell silent, he walked up to the podium, still holding the child who was comfortable in his arms, and added, yes, of course, you should come indeed. You can heal your flesh here, but this is not the main thing. Most important is for us all to understand ourselves and our purpose. We must understand this so we aren't cleared off the face of the earth like trash. Together we must all clean up. After ourselves, clear away the dirt we created. Thank you all for your attention. The scene in the president office disappeared and Anastasia's voice continued. It's hard to say whether the president's speech or little Dasha had influence on the people listening to the live broadcast from Russia, but people didn't want to believe the rumors being spread about Russia's aggressiveness anymore. People wanted to live and to live happily, and they believe in that possibility. Those wanting to visit Russia and spend time there increased many times after the direct broadcast from Kremlin. Those who returned from Russia could no longer live their former life, and awareness blazed up in each of them like the first ray of sun in the morning's dawn. Tales from the Future School or Lesson of the Gods From the book by Vladimir Legre, Co-Creation Translated by Marion Schwartz I saw as if looking down among many parcels of land, one that was different from all the others, and its inner layout. In it, there were several large wooden buildings connected by path lines, with different flower beds. Next to the set of structure was, was a natural amphitheater, a no where rows of benches descended from top to bottom in a semicircle, and where about 300 people of different ages were sitting. Among them were older people with gray and their hair and people who were quite young. They seemed to be sitting in families. Since grown men, women, and children of different ages sat hig higgly piggly, Everyone was talking to everyone else excitedly as if they were about to see something unusual, a superstar concert or a president spe presidential speech. On a wooden stage up front were two little tables, two chairs, and a large blackboard in back. Next to the platform was a group of children, 15 or so, ranging in age from 5 to 12 and engage in lively debate about something. There is something like a Cygnosium or astronomy about to begin. I heard Anastasia's voice. Why are the children here? Didn't their parents have anyone to leave them with? I asked Anastasia. One of them from the group of debating children is just about to give the main report. They're still choosing, choosing who this will be. See, there are two candidates, a boy nine years old and a girl of eight. Now the children are voting. <clears throat> the majority chose the boy. A business-like little boy approached the table with a confident step he took some papers with plans and drawings out of a manila folder and laid them on the table. All the children either gradually walked or skipped along to join their parents sitting on the benches. The red-haired, freckle-faced little girl, the other candidate for the speech, walked past the table with a proudly raised head. She was holding a bigger and thicker folder than the boy. There were probably drawings and plans in that folder too. 
The boy by the table tried to say something to the girl candidate walking by, but the child didn't stop. She straightened her red braid and walked past, turning away demonstratively. For a while, the boy watched, distraught as the proud red-haired child moved away. Then he again began to set out his pages with great concentration. Who taught, thought these, who taught these children astronomy so well that they can give a report to adults? I asked Anastasia. No one taught them, she replied. It was suggested to them, but they themselves figure out how it is all arranged and then prepare and present their conclusions. They have been preparing for more than two weeks and now the important moment has come. Their conclusions can be opposed by anyone who wants to, and they will defend their opinion. So this is like a game. You could call what is going on a game, but it is very serious game. Each person present will engage and accelerate his thought about the planetary arrangement and perhaps will begin to think about something bigger. After all, the children have been thinking for two weeks, contemplating, and their thinking is not limited by any dogmas. They do not have any present interpretations of the planetary arrangement hang over them, hanging over them. We still do not know what they will come out with. We still do not know what they will come out with. Do you mean to say that they will dream up something with their childish intellect? I mean to say they will present their theory. The adults do not have axioms of the planetary arrangement either, after all. The goal of the symposium is not to work out any canons, but to accelerate thought, which subsequently will determine the truth or come close to it. A young man walked up to the second little table and announced to the beginning of the report. The boy began to speak. He spoke confidently and enthusiastically for 25 or 30 minutes. His speech seemed to me total childish fantasy, a fantasy not based on any scientific theories or even the elementary knowledge of a high school astronomy course. The boy said approximately the following. If you look at the sky at night, there are a whole lot of stars shining there. There are different kinds of stars. There are very little stars and bigger ones. But the very little stars can be big too. We only think they're little at first, but they are very big. Because when an airplane flies high up, it's little. But when we go up to it, to it on the ground, it looks big. And lots of people can fit inside it. Each star could fit a lot of people. Only there aren't any people in the stars right now. But they shine at night. The big ones shine. The big ones shine and so do the little ones. They shine so that we will look at them and think about them. The stars want us to do everything as well on them as on earth. They envy the earth a little. They want the same kinds of berries and trees to grow on them as we have and to have the same kind of streams and little fish. The stars are waiting for us and each is trying to shine so that we notice it. But we still can't fly to them because we have a lot to do at home. But when we finish up everything at home and everywhere, and things are fine, all over the earth, we'll fly to the stars. Only, we won't fly on a plane or a rocket, because it takes a long time to fly on a plane, and it's long and boring on a rocket. Also, not everyone will fit on a plane or rocket, 
and rocket won't hold all kinds of freight and trees won't fit or restrain. When we've made everything all over the earth good, we, the whole earth, will fly to the first star. A few other stars will want to fly to earth themselves and press up to it. They've already sent us little bits and their little bits have pressing up to the earth. At first, people thought these were comets, but these are bits of stars that want very much to press up to the beautiful earth. They were sent by the stars that are waiting for us. We can fly up to a distant stars as the whole earth. And whoever wants to can, whoever wants to can stay on the star so that it would be handsome there like on earth. The boy lifted his pages and showed them to his listeners. On the pages were drawings of the starry sky and trajectories of the earth movements toward the stars. In the last drawing, two stars bloom in garden and gardens and earth move away from them in its intergalactic flight. When the boy finished speaking and showing his drawings, the moderator announced that whoever wanted to could speak as an opponent or express his own ideas regarding what he had heard. But no one was in any hurry to speak. Everyone was silent. And it seemed to me, agitated of some re for some reason, why are they so agitated? I asked Anastasia. Do none of the adults know astronomy? They're agitated because we need to bring good arguments and speak coherently. After all, their children are present. If a speech is, an, is incomprehensible or unacceptable to a child's soul, mistrust will arise toward the speaker or even worse, dislike. The adults treasure the regard for them and are agitated and don't want to take a risk. They're afraid of looking mean in front of those gathered and most of all in front of their own children. The heads of many of those present began turning in the direction of an elderly, graying man sitting in the middle of the hall. He had his arms around the shoulders of the little red-headed girl, the one who was one of the candidates for the report. Next to them sat a young and very pretty woman. Anastasia commented. Many are now looking at the graying man in the middle of the hall. He is a university professor, a scientist. He is retired now. At first, his private life didn't work out and he had no children. 10 years ago, he took a parcel of land and began setting it up himself. A young woman came to love him and they had this little red haired girl. The young woman next to him is his wife and the mother of his daughter. The former professor loves his late child very much and the red-haired girl, his daughter, regards him with great respect and love. Many of those present believe that the professor should speak first. But the graying professor was slow to speak. It was obvious he was drumming a magazine out of agitation. Finally, the professor rose and began to say something about the structure of the universe, comets, and the Earth's mass. Finally, he concluded, the planet Earth, of course, does move in space and rotates, but it is indissolubly linked with the solar system and cannot move toward distant galaxies independently without the solar system. The sun gives life to every living thing on earth. Moving away from the sun would mean its significant cooling on earth. And as a consequence, 
the planet's death. We can all observe what happens even when we move to relatively short way from the sun. Winter happens. The professor suddenly fell silent. The boy speaker was going through his drawings, distraught, then looking inquiringly at his classmates with whom he had prepared his speech. But evidently, the argument about winter and cooling was very weighty weighty and understandable to everyone. This argument destroyed a pretty childish dream of coming flight. Suddenly, in the silence that followed, which had already lasted half a minute, the graying professor voice was heard again. Winter, life always dies down if the earth does not have enough solar energy. Always. No scientific theoretical investigations are needed to see this, to be convinced. However, it may be that the earth itself has the same kind of energy as the sun, but it just hasn't shown itself. No one has discovered it yet. Maybe you will one day. Maybe the earth can be self-sufficient. This energy will manifest itself in something. The sun's energy will manifest on earth, and like solar energy, it will unfold the the flower's petals. And when we can travel on earth through the galaxy, but then, the professor broke off and fell silent. A murmur of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction arose in the hall, and it began. Adults rose from their seats to refute the professor. When it came to the possibility of living without the sun, they said something about planet photosynthesis, about the temperature of the environment, about the trajectories of the movement of the planets, which no one planet can can exit. The professor sat, dropping his graying head lower and lower. His red-headed daughter turned her head to face its speaker and sometimes rose slightly as if she wanted to defend her father from his opponents with her body. An elderly woman who looked like a teacher took the floor and began talking about how bad it is to indulge and flatter children for the sake of their self-esteem. Any lie will be exposed in time. And then how are we all going to look? This is not simply a lie. It's a cowardice, the woman said. The red-haired girl latched onto the lapels of her father's jacket. She began shaking him, nearly crying, repeating in a breaking voice, Papuchuka, you lied about energy. Did you lie, Papuchuka? Because we're children? The lady said you were being cowardly. Is being cowardly a bad thing? Silence fell in the open air hall. The professor lifted his head, looked into his daughter's eyes, put his hand on her little shoulder and said softly, I believe what I said, my daughter. The red-haired child fell silent again. Then she quickly climbed up on the seat and her high child's voice shouted to the hall, My papa is not cowardly. My father believed it. He believed it. The little girl sent her gaze around the new quiet hall. No one looked in their direction. She turned toward her mother, but the young woman had turned away and lowered her head buttoning and unbuttoning the buttons on her jacket sleeve. The little girl again sent her gaze around the silent hall and turned to her father. The professor continued as before to look helplessly at his little daughter. The red-haired girl's voice was heard again in the absolute silence, but now it was kind and not loud. The people don't believe you, Papa Chuk. 
they don't believe it because an energy still hasn't appeared on earth that could open the flowers petals like the nice sun but when it do, when it does appear all the people will believe you when it appears they will believe you she straightened her bangs with a quick move it, movement jumped into the aisle and ran off when she reached the edge of the open air hall, she headed for one of their nearby houses, ran in the door, and a couple of seconds later, appeared in the doorway again. She was holding a pot with some kind of plant on it. She ran with it to the now empty table for the speaker. She put the potted plant on the table, and her child's voice, loud and confident, was heard over the heads of those present. Here is a flower. It has closed its petals. The petals of all the flowers have closed because there is no sun. But they will open soon because there is energy on the earth. I, I am going to turn into energy that will open the flower's petals. The red-haired girl squeezed her little fingers into fists and began looking at the flower without blinking. The people sitting in their seats did not talk. Everyone was watching the little girl and the potted plant on the table in front of her. The professor slowly rose from his seat and walked toward his daughter. He walked up to her and took her by the shoulders trying to lead her away. But the red head jerked her shoulders and whispered, Why don't you help me, Papa Shukra? The professor must have been completely distraught. He remained standing next to his daughter, his hands on her child's shoulders, and he began looking at the flower too. Nothing was happening to the flower. I felt sorry for the red-haired girl and the graying professor. Why did he have to go babbling on with his statements about his belief and an undiscovered energy? All of a sudden, the boy who had given the report stood up in the first row. He turned halfway to the hall, sitting silent, silently, sniffed and walked toward the table. He approached the table with dignity and confidence and stood next to the red-haired girl. He too directed his state at the plant and the clay pot. But of course, as before, nothing was happening to the plant. And then I saw it. I saw children of different ages start standing up from their seats in the hall, one after the another. The children walked toward the table. They stood side by side in silence and looked closely at the flower. Last was a girl of about six, bringing along her very little brother, holding him with her two little hands. They squeeze in front of those standing there. With difficulty and with someone help, she stood her little brother on the chair in front of the table. The little gray, the little, the little guy gazing around at those standing there turned toward the flower and started blowing on it. All of a sudden, the petals of one of the flowers on the plant in the pot began slowly opening, very slowly. But the quieted people in the hall noticed it. Some of them rose silently from their seats. A second flower on the table opened its petals and along with it, a third and a fourth. Hey, the elderly woman who looked like a teacher exclaimed in an ecstatic child child's voice. And she began to clap. The hall broke out in applause. The handsome young woman who was the professor's wife ran from the hall toward the professor who had stepped aside from the exultant children by the flower and was wiping his temple. She flung her arms, arms around his neck and began kissing his cheeks and lips. 
The red-haired girl took a step toward her, kissing parents, but the little boy reporter held her back. She jerked her arm away, but after taking a few steps, she turned around, went right up to him, rebuttoned the unbuttoned button on his shirt, smiled and turning quickly, ran to her hugging parents. More and more people from the hall came up to the table. Some picked up their children, some shook the young, young um, speaker's hand. He stood there holding out his hand for shaking, and with his second hand, pressed the button, just buttoned by the red-haired girl. Someone started playing something halfway between a Russian and gypsy song on the, bat, on the bay end. An old woman started tapping his foot on the stage, and a stoutish woman walked out to him like a plump swan. Two young fellows began a rollicking, squatting, squatting dance, and the flower with its open petals turned toward the rollicking, rushing dance, which was drawing more and more people with its staring. Tells from the future, a love that creates worlds. From the book by Vladimir Magra, The New Civilization, Part 1. Translated by Susan Downing. Spring was coming into bloom on planet Yamaza, Yamaza. Grasses resembling earth, grasses and flowers on the trees and bushes were seed scenting the air. Along the path amidst the spring magnificence, Vladislav was walking to the symposium. He would be giving a lecture about the origin of about the origin of life on planet Yalmaza. His childhood friend Lodomir would serve as his opponent. At the ripe age of nineteen, Vladislav possessed a broad enough volume of information to present his theory at any level of the academic board. But his friend, Vladimir, knowledge was no less than his. Vladimir and his group of supporters would exploit any weak point in the speech or any inadequate reasoning regarding past events. Ludmilla would be at the symposium too. Ludmilla, it just so happened that both of them had loved this girl from the time they were children. They love her, but they didn't admit their love, not to each other and not to the girl. Waiting instead for some kind of sign from Ludmilla, which of them would she prefer? Vladislav took the long way there on purpose so he could think through his presentation one more time, but something kept him from concentrating. He had the feeling someone was watching him. And when he heard some rustling behind him, Vladislav turned around abruptly. Someone darted from the path into the bushes and froze in the grass. Vladislav took a few steps back in that direction and caught sight of his four-year-old sister, Katya, hiding in the grass beneath the bushes. So, Kartoneka, once again, you're on my towel, Vladislav said, addressing his sister affectionately. Serious business awaits me. Don't you understand that you might be disturbing me? Of course you understand. That's why you're hiding in the grass. I'm not hiding. I'm just lying here. I'm taking a look at a flower and some bugs. Little Katya informed him making believe she really was interested in the little flower. Ah, I see. Okay then, keep lying there and looking, but I'm going on ahead. Katya immediately jumped up, ran up to Vladislav and quickly said, You go on ahead, Vladislav. I'll walk behind you, quiet as a mouse, so I won't disturb your thinking. When we get to where all the people have gathered, you take my hand so everyone can see what a handsome and smart brother I have. Well, okay. Don't sweet talk me. Give me your hand. 
But remember, when I or someone else is giving a speech, don't even think of commenting on what the adults have said the way you did last time. Satisfy Kratinika grab Budik by the hand and promise. Lad Chick, I'll try with all my might not to comment. Elderly and young representatives, representatives of curious regions of planet, Yalmeza were filling up the outdoor amphitheater. No one had pens or pads or anything at all to write with. Their natural memory made it possible for them to remember all that was said, down to the tiniest details. Nor did Vladislav, who had stepped out before the audience, have any props. With the power of his mind, he could construct holograms and space that would show any pictures of the past and produce everyday items and even feelings. A bit nervous, Vladislav began his lecture. The planet on which we live is called Yalmisa. Its age is more than 90 trillion years, but life appeared on it only 300 years ago. We are obliged for the appearance of life to our ancestors, two residents of planet Earth, or to be more precise, the appearance of life on planet Yalmisa occurred under the influence of the energy of love and the dream of two inhabitants of planet Earth. For this reason, I will present historically information about the life of the Earthlings. The initial period of life for the people of Earth might well have been the same as ours. They knew and sensed both their planet and the life's purpose of the universe well. The earthlings ascertained the life's purpose of all living organisms of their planet and made skillful use of them. But one day, a catastrophe occurred. A virus invaded the consciousness of one of the Earth's inhabitants. A virus that began to spread aggressively among the planet's other inhabitants. Our scientists have named this virus using the word death. The outer signs of this virus, virus as historically data attests, consists of the following symptoms. People attacked by it begin to destroy the living. Perfect diversity of the planet. Constructing in its place a primitive artificial world. Earthlings themselves call this period of life the technocratic period. People attacked by the death virus began changing from rational beings into irrational beings. They flocked together in large numbers on small plots of land and built dwellings for themselves that looked like stone cribs, stacked one atop the other. Imagine a stone mountain with a multitude of hollows bored unto it. These are roughly the kind of stone mountains that people built with their own two hands and called houses. They call these hollow crypts in the artificial mountains apartments. They called a large cluster of these artificial stone mountains with the crypts adjoining each other cities. And these so-called cities, there was air that wasn't fit to breathe and water not fit to drink and stale food. Separate organs of the human being would begin to rot and decay. While the organism was still alive, of course, it's difficult to imagine a moving human body inside which the organs are rotting and decaying, but that's the way it was. Historically, sources attest to the fact that 
people of the technocratic age even had a science called medicine. They considered the greatest achievement of this science the ability to replace internal organs. People didn't understand that the very existence of such a science indicated that the inadequacy of their consciousness. But it wasn't just people's flesh that was decaying. Their consciousness was swiftly degrading in their intellect. Their thoughts slowed down and they even began losing the ability to count and invent the calculator. They lost the ability to construct holograms in space and invent the television. That's a kind of primitive device that shows something resembling a hologram. Once they lost the ability to move through space, they began constructing artificial apparatus and call them automobiles, airplanes, and rockets. From time to time, various groups of people would attack others and kill each other. But the most unbelievable thing is that the death virus made people believe that they were not eternal, but only temporary in their perceived space. In their perceived space day. More and more, the acts of people in the technocratic period turned planet Earth into a foul-smelling spot in the universe, wrecking of fumes. But the universal intelligence didn't destroy this noxious spot, but instead kept waiting for something. Interrupt and let us lie. Lectures. A voice rang out from within the group of the opponents, headed by Vladislav's friend Vladimir. Stop for a minute, please. There's no point on continuing your speech. Something like that could not have happened on Earth. All right, I'll stop my lecture if you really can prove the implausibility of what I said. A young man rose from among the group of opponents and announced the following. We have authoritative evidence that religion exists within the community of earthlings. The religious tracts told of how the earth and everything growing on it was created by the universal intelligence. They called it God. They would worship him and perform a great number of rites in his name. I hope, esteemed lecturer, that you won't deny that fact. No, I won't, replied Vladislav. Then tell me, how can one perform rites in an honor of one's God and simultaneously destroy his creations? It's impossible to do both at the same time. Consequently, thick thickly, Settled cities could have existed on earth. People could not have polluted the water created by the God they revered. And besides, the universal intelligence could not have allowed that kind of bachana. Otherwise, we can't even call it intelligence. Quite the opposite. We'd have to call into question the intelligence of what has been created by it. Of man, first of all, what do you have to say to that, esteemed lecturer? I'll say that the existence of intelligence, especially universal intelligence, is the unity of two great sources, intelligence and anti-intelligence. The anti-intelligent period of life for the people of planet Earth was necessary. And if you'll permit me, in my subsequent remarks, I'll prove that two great sources exist in man. All right, continue. The young man assented and then took his seat. The universal world is a union of opposites. Vladislav continued confidently. 
And man also reflects this union of opposites in himself. Within the unbelievable chaos that befells the people of earth, there suddenly arose people who were able to understand. These people changed their relationship to earthly creations, not in words and not with the help of religious treaties. They began changing their way of life. They themselves didn't yet fully comprehend the scale of their creation. And they call their actions simply building a family homestead. They didn't yet know that by touching the earth with a new awareness, they were beginning to revive the planets of the universe. That doubt would not exist for them. That their descendants would call the children they bore gods. They were simply building their family homesteads on the planet Earth. The universal intelligence followed their action and bated breath and wonder. And there came a time when all the people of the Earth began to live on their beautiful homesteads. And there came a day when, look, I'll show you a hologram. You'll see two people in it. And the space in front of the audience arose an earth landscape. Two elderly people, a man and a woman, were walking hand in hand along a path that led from their homestead to the forest. They were clearly more than a hundred years old. Evening was falling and stars, as yet barely visible, were appearing in the sky. The people walked up to a cedar tree and the elderly woman leaned her back against it. I'm a grandmother and a great grandmother and you still keep asking me to walk beneath the starry sky, just like when we were young. The woman said tenderly addressing her companion, but don't you want to do that too? Of course I do, my love. He took hold of her shoulders embrace her impulsively and kiss her on the lips. Then pulling the shoulder strap of her dress to the side, he revealed her shoulder and the moonlight three moles all in a row were clearly visible on the woman's left shoulder. The man kissed each one of them. You're just the same as you were, my love, and I don't want to part from you. And we won't part. We'll die and be born anew. We can't be reborn, she said sadly. Look, there's still less and less open land on earth all the time. There are gardens and homesteads all around. And there may not be enough room for our grandchildren. Most likely the creator miscalculated somehow when he was creating our earth. I don't think so. There's some way out. We just don't know what it is yet. But I'm certain that our love cannot be severe. severe. You and I will die so that we can be born anew. But where? Look, my love. On that star, may our thought create life that resembles life here on Earth, on a new planet. Think about it. Why did it occur to him to create so many planets? It wasn't for no reason. Our thought is material and it will create for us life on a lifeless planet. We will materialize again and again, our love. Thank you for the beautiful dream, my love. With you, I will help you give birth to life on the new planet. My love, what shall we call the planet of our new life? Yalmeza. Let that be called that, Yalmeza. Wait for us, and while you're waiting, burst into bloom with gardens, 
cover yourself with grasses, just as I wish. The man pronounced confidently and passionately. And as I, too, wish, she answered. The hologram disappeared. Vladislav bowed to the audience and stepped off to the side, ceding his spot to his friend and opponent, Radomir. Radomir took Vladislav's spot, cast a glance over the audience, and began to speak. I must oppose my friend, and I'll say straight away, there is much in his theory that's unproven and even contradictory. Like my friends, I can't believe that this absolutely absurd period in the life of people existed. The hologram he showed, as we all understand, is the will of his thought, of his imagination, and it demands confirmation. Although this hologram did produce some kind of strange sensation in me, it seemed to me that my friend took it from among stories we already know, only I can't recall what its source is. A murmur passed through the amphitheater and exclamations were heard. Could he really have plagiarized it? Unheard of, but perhaps the lecturer didn't know. Plagiarism, I definitely had the feeling it was something I'd seen before. Vladislav lowered his head and stood off to the side. He winced when he heard a child cry from the fire rose of the, of the seated people. Ah, it was his irrepressible sister, Ekaterika, shouting. It's good that she's just shouting and not com commenting on what's going on, thought Vladislav. But he was mistakenly waiting until silence had fallen. Ekaterina loudly announced, Don't even dare to argue with my brother because he's very smart and sensitive. Yes, that's a weighty argument. Range out some snickers. That's correct. Very weighty. Weighty, continued little Atrika, Akatrika. And you, Radomir Shik, stop staring, staring at Ludmilla. Don't stare, and that's it. Katya, be quiet, shouted Vladislav. I won't be quiet. Ludmilka loves you, and you love her. I know for sure. Katya Vladislav shouted once more and then headed toward his sister. Ludmila, why are you just sitting there? exclaimed Katya. Stop him. He won't let me have my say. He's going to drag me away now by force. A brown-haired girl stood up from the farthest row, went toward Vladislav, and barred his path. Ludmila's cheeks were burning red. Lowering her head, she whispered, Your sister is right, Vladislav. The hush audience heard her whisper. The heads of those in attendance turned to little Ekatrika, and people smiled at her and applauded. Inspired by the audience support, the little girl ran to Radomir, who stood before the hall, took her spot beside him, and headed her and held her little hands aloft, quieting the hall with her gesture. When everyone had fallen silent, she began speaking once again, addressing Radomir. And you, Radomir Shik, you were just about to become a traitor. Don't criticize my brother. He showed everything correctly. He's your friend. You're his friend. And don't criticize him. Radomir condescendingly looked down at the little girl from above and addressing both her and those sitting in the amphitheater. Just as condescending, he said, I'm not criticizing, I'm simply stating a fact. There's not enough proof for the hologram he showed. There's not a single bit of proof. 
there is one or even two. Katarina announced firmly. And what might and where might it be? Or they, if there are two. One of them, that's me. The second, that's you, Vladimir. The little girl said confidently. At these words, words, she undid two little buttons in her little dress and revealed her little shoulder. On little Akrchenika's left shoulder, Vladimir glimpsed three moles that were just like the ones the elderly earth woman shone in the hologram had. Vladimir took a close look at the moles on shoulder of the little girl and the blood began pulsing more and more strongly in his veins. He made an effort to remember before him appeared a, whole, appeared a holy land that he alone could see. An earth landscape, he kisses the three moles on the shoulder of his beloved. Then she embraces him. Laughing, she tossles his hair, as always, kisses the tip of his nose, laughing. The hologram disappear. The hologram disappear. Vladimir looked a bit longer at Akatrinika, who was standing before him. Her shoulders still bare. Then he quickly leaned over, picked the little girl up in his arms and pressed her to him. She embraced him and laughing, tossed his hair and quickly kissing the tip of his nose. He held little Akrotnika in his arms and she whispered in his ears. You were in too much of a hurry, Varamich, or maybe I was born a bit too late. Now wait until I grow up. Wait for 14 years. You won't be happy with any other girls. Girls, I'm your other half. I'll wait for you to grow up, my love. The young man quietly answered. Worn out from the excitement and calm now, Ekrachenika rested her head on Vladimir's shoulder and fell into a sweet sleep. But he silently stood before the hushed audience and carefully had his future wife in his arms. He was mentally writing letters in space. Those gathered there read the text of the hologram he created. Proof exists. It is within each of us. Endless and eternal is love in the universe. Then slowly and gently, so as to not awaken the little girl asleep on his shoulder, Vladimir made his way toward the exit. He forgot to disconnect his thought from space, and the hologram continued to fill up with letters. Those gathered there understood that these words weren't addressed to them, but they couldn't help reading them. You ran barefoot amongst the stars. You didn't seek love for yourself. You on your own and the expenses of the universe. You preserve what we must preserve together. Words intended for the little girl of the planet Yelmisa and the earth woman, the goddess who had given life to their planet. The little goddess slept sweetly on Vladimir's shoulder and perhaps in her sleep, she also heard the words of her beloved.